All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day last. We have uh, our agenda for today before us. Um, we're gonna start here with administrative matters. I'll first turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden to see if he has any announcements for us. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members and uh, everyone else listening in. Um, this morning, uh, we do have a, a, an update on salmon. It is still coming together. Um, it looks like we will be prepared to take that up perhaps uh, late this morning. Um, I would advise us to start, as you say, with uh, administrative matters and we can proceed um, with those until salmon is ready. Um, I do not have any other comments, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. And uh, just a reminder for those of us who are here in person, the uh, checkout time is 11. So we will uh, endeavor to have a longer break before then to give folks a chance to clear out their rooms if they haven't done that already. So um, first uh, on our agenda is agenda item C5, approval of council meeting records. Uh, those are materials that were in the briefing book. And I'll look to see if there's any uh, corrections or a motion to approve. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to do that, Virgil Moore, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the materials as presented. Thank you very much, Virgil. Is there a second? Seconded by Heather Hall. Any discussion? Not seeing any discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? All right. Motion passes unanimously. We have approved our council meeting records uh, for November and January. Um, we'll now move on to agenda item C6, membership appointments and council operating procedures. And I'll turn to Deputy Executive Director Mike Berner for that. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Good morning, council members. Agenda item C6, this is our uh, typical uh, agenda administrative item where we look at uh, appointments to our advisory bodies, any changes to council member designees, and consider potential changes to our council operating procedures. Uh, we have a, quite a bit of uh, nomination work to, to go through and then a little bit of discussion about uh, some COP provisions regarding our quick response letter process to get through today. So uh, I will start us off uh, and run through uh, the appointment business we have. I'll make some brief remarks about uh, the quick response process, maybe look to uh, Executive Director Burden uh, to add to that. Um, then we have uh, we have no other advisory body uh, reports to work through uh, for this session. And last I checked, we didn't have, have public comment. So uh, regarding council officers, members, and designees, uh, we did get a letter from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regarding their designees to the council. Uh, they asked that uh, Mr. Roy Elliker, Mr. David Teicher, Mr. Tom Sinclair, and Dr. Denise Hawkins be removed from their list of designees. They would like to add uh, Dr. Benjamin Cross as a new designee. Um, and just noting that Dr. Kyle Hansen, Mr. Roger Root, Mr. Michael Clark, and Mr. John Netto will continue as designees for, for the service. Uh, so there is no further uh, action required here, just uh, for, in, for your information. Regarding council advisory body appointments, uh, we've got notice from uh, Oregon State Police that Sergeant Heather Van Meter uh, will be serving as an alternate to Ryan Howell uh, on the, on the, as an enforcement consultant for Oregon. Um, and again, there's no further council action there that we will update our roster there accordingly. Um, we did get some nominations uh, for some of our management teams, uh, and these will require council uh, a motion to make these appointments should you move forward. Regarding the coastal pelagic species management team, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has nominated Ms. Lisa Hillier to replace Ms. Lorna Wargo as the Washington representative on the CPS management team. Regarding the ground fish management team, uh, Washington has then nominated Ms. Lauren Awargo to replace Erica Wayland as their representative to the ground fish management team. 
Regarding the salmon technical team, we got two nominations. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has nominated Ms. Emily Shallow to replace Mr. Craig Foster as the ODFW representative on the salmon team. And regarding California, uh, we've got a nomination for Ms. Candace Morgenstern uh, to fill the current vacancy uh, on the salmon technical team for California. And again, all of those uh, technical team and plan team uh, nominations would require code council motions. Uh, additionally, uh, regarding the 2022 through 2024 advisory body term that's just getting underway, we left the November 2021 council meeting with a few vacancies uh, when we filled all those term limited seats back then. Uh, those were reopened for nominations over the course of the winter for your consideration at this meeting. Uh, regarding the ground fish advisory sub panel, there was a one sport fisheries at large position. Uh, we got two nominations there, uh, Mr. David Kishida and Mr. Tom Schiff. Um, the council had noted that they were looking preferably for a, a representation from someone with a knowledge of Washington sport fisheries. Uh, as you can see, these two gentlemen uh, from California, and we would need uh, a motion to, to, to move forward with one of those uh, nominees should the council go that direction. Regarding the ground fish advisory sub panel as well, we had an at-large processor seat, Mr. Jonathan Gonzalez nominated himself with some considerable uh, support in your public, in the, excuse me, in your briefing materials. Regarding the habitat committee, Mr. Casey Baldwin was nominated by the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation uh, to represent uh, Columbia River or Northwest tribes on the habitat committee. Regarding the highly migratory species advisory sub panel, there was a vacancy we left for a processor north of Cape Mendocino. Uh, we got one nomination there, uh, Mr. Leif Gilder's sleeve uh, out of Portland. Regarding the Simon advisory sub panel, we left with a vacancy for Idaho sport fisheries. We got two nominees, uh, Mr. Harry Morse and a Mr. Donald Vernon. And lastly, we've got, uh, we had two at-large vacancies for the Scientific and Statistical Committee. The council went out uh, with a request for nominees with experience, expertise in oceanography or social sciences. We got two nominees, a Dr. Lauren Dr Dracopoulos and a Dr. Matthew Reimer uh, for your consideration. Uh, and again, all of these uh, positions for the 22-24 advisory body term would, would need a council motion uh, should we move forward there. Uh, that's the business under appointments. I would also note in your briefing materials for C6 uh, attachment one, there is a uh, write-up that council staff put together regarding the quick response procedure that's listed in your council operating procedure one. Uh, this is a process that's designed to allow the council to respond to requests for comments or comment periods that fall outside of the uh, a council session. It's It's been in place for quite a while. It's being uh, coming under increasing use uh, as more and more requests of the council come through that don't quite fit our schedule exactly. Uh, and I believe Executive Director Burden has some, some comments and some thoughts regarding that procedure, uh, just to clarify for folks uh, how we use that and how we plan to go forward with that. So with that, I would turn it over to the head table if anyone has any extra remarks on the things I went through. Uh, otherwise, uh, I believe we could move into uh, public comment if we have any, and then the council action, where again, we have quite a few uh, nominees to work through. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mike. Are there any questions of, of Mike on the overview? All right. Um, we don't have any reports, and I'm not seeing any public comment let me just double check there there is no there is no public comment so we'll move into council discussion and action that is to consider uh the any appointments and membership issues and what we see it there on the screen there so i know that uh this um, when it came to appointments these are things we covered in in closed session so i am going to um, go to my sheet here, my cheat sheet here, and I will look to see if there is uh, someone wants to uh, make a motion with regard to Miss Lisa Hillier, Heather Hong. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Actually, uh, in this motion, I'll cover uh, the nomination for Miss Wargo and Miss Lorna Wargo. Yes, Hillier. Thank you. 
I move the council appoint Ms. Lisa Hillier to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team and appoint Ms. Lorna Wargo to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the Ground Fish Management Team. All right, and that's seconded by Phil Anderson. Uh, please speak to your motion as necessary. Sure, thank you. Um, both uh, Ms. Hillier and Ms. Wargo are um, excellent candidates for these uh, management teams. I know much, men, most of the council uh, is familiar with Ms. Wargo, who long uh, has been on the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team for a long time. Uh, Ms. Hillier is new to the Pacific Council, but not new to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, so she does have some experience. I think they'll both uh, just provide um, <laughs> excellent contributions to the council management teams and the council process in general. That's, thank you. All right, thank you very much for the motion. Heather, any discussion on the motion? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, welcome to Lisa and Lorna, or Lorna's <laughs> just changing seats, I guess, here. All right, uh, we now have, uh, the next I have on my list is an appointment to the Salmon Technical Team from the state of Oregon. I'll look to um, either Chris Kern or Maggie Summer. Welcome Maggie, virtually. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Gorelnik. And uh, do you have a motion? I, I, indeed I do, and it's appearing on screen. So I move the council appoint Ms. Emily Shallow to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the Salmon Technical Team. All right, thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Krista Svensson. Please speak to your motion. Thanks very much, Chair. Ms. Shallow brings uh, expertise in a range of uh, field and lab fishery science, research and data analysis, and we are very glad to have her come on board with ODFW and the STT. Uh, at, we are also grateful to Craig Foster for uh, staying on a little bit to help with the transition uh, over the meetings this spring. All right, thank you. Thank you for the motion. Any discussion? Okay, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Welcome, Emily. All right, now we have a uh, also a position on the Salmon Technical Team from the state of California. So I'll look for a motion there. Uh, Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sandra. I move the council appoint Ms. Candace Morgenstern to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the Salmon Technical Team. Thank you for the motion. Let's see if there's a second. Seconded by Robert Dooley. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're very pleased to have Candace Morgenstern joining us in the STT arena. Uh, she's been following along with the work of the STT for many years as uh, a seasoned uh, veteran from our Ocean Salmon Project. She has many years of overseeing field monitoring and assisting with regulatory development and uh, other needed information on uh, salmon science and management for the public. So we're um, pleased to be adding her to the SDT ranks. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the motion. Any discussion on this motion? Uh, okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Welcome, Candace. We'll turn next to the uh, vacant sport fisheries at large position on the ground fish advisory sub panel. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Sandra. I move the council appoint Mr. David Kashida to the vacant sport fisheries at large position on the ground fish advisory sub panel. All right, thank you for the motion. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Heather Hall. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we did not receive any applicants from, from Washington. However, we were fortunate to receive a couple of applicants from 
farther south. And uh, Mr. Kashida comes from the central northern part of California. There's some similarities certainly between the ground fish fisheries there and those in Washington. And so we're, we're pleased to, I'm pleased to put forward Mr. Kashida's name for this position. All right, thank you. Any discussion on this motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion and welcome, David. All right, we have a vacancy on the North of Cape Mendocino processor position on the HMS AS. Ms. Krista Svensson? Yeah, I move the council appoint Mr. Leif Gildersleeve to the vacant processor north of Cape Mendocino position on the highly migratory species advisory subpanel. All right, thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Corey Ridings. Please speak to your motion. Yeah, thank you. I've known Mr. Gildersleeve for about a decade. He was a buyer uh, when I was selling albacore loins. He's been actively engaged in learning about the fishery, both for fishermen and for processors. And I've watched him grow his business from uh, being a one-man show to 30 employees, which gives him the ability and the time to participate in the council process. Um, furthermore, in reaching out to stakeholders, he has um, processor support, which is important because he's not a traditional processor in the sense we normally see in the council process. Uh, and that support came from both large and small processors. So it, it was not unanimous in terms of not everybody responded back, but it was unanimous in terms of size and composition of the representation. I look forward to seeing Mr. Gildersleeve at council meetings, and uh, I would encourage him to get his camper van ready, uh, as he had said he was willing to go out and meet with and engage with Northern processors. All right, thank you very much, Krista, uh, for the motion. Um, is there any discussion on this motion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Krista, for the motion, and welcome, Leaf. Uh, now we'll move to the vacant uh, Idaho sport fisheries position on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. I'll look for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move the council appoint Mr. Donald Ver Vernon to the vacant Idaho sport fish position on the Salmon Advisory Committee. All right, thank you for the motion. I look for a second. <laughs> Seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Vernon has an extensive background in civil engineering, working with a lot of environmental projects throughout the West, much of it in uh, federal compliance with water quality, air quality. Uh, spent a stint at the Idaho National Laboratory uh, working out there. I've talked with Mr. Vernon. I do not know him. He is one of two applicants we had, and but his enthusiasm and his extensive knowledge, personal knowledge, as well as his professional uh, knowledge and accomplishments, I think will bring um, a refreshing uh, new face to the Salmon Advisory Group. So um, that's uh, all the background I got. His materials are in there, and it, it, he's, he's a fine person. We're fortunate to have had two good applicants. I also want to say I appreciate the help from California and working through uh, some of the issues we had with those two ca uh, applicants. All right, thank you very much uh, for the motion. Are there any discussion? Not seeing any discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We'll turn now to a vacant at-large position on the Scientific and Statistical Committee. Um, look for an, a, a motion there. Ms. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the council appoint Dr. Matthew Reimer to a vacant at-large position on the Scientific and Statistical Committee. Thank you for the motion. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Krista Svensson. Thank you, Krista. Please speak to your motion. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Reimer has deep experience and fills a needed role on the SSC, so I'm pleased to put his name forward for the SSC ranks. All right, thank you for the motion. Any discussion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Welcome, Matthew. Uh, those are the motions I have. I'll turn back to Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate those motions and moving those forward. Thank you. Um, just in recap, that does uh, leave a few vacancies uh, left. We have a remaining vacancy uh, on the Habitat Committee representing Northwest and Columbia River Tribal Representatives, uh, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel at-large processor position, and one at-large position for the SSC. Uh, the, these positions were discussed in closed session. Uh, the council had some discussions about uh, expertise and the representation there that we weren't able to resolve at this session. April's gonna come up quickly. So it's my understanding that we will revisit these vacancies in June and discuss uh, ways forward in terms of, of filling those uh, in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Um, let's turn to our next uh, item here that is to provide feedback on the council staff proposal for the QR procedure. And for that, I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would refer you to um, the attachment from the uh, attachment C6 attachment one. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a mouthful of marbles this morning. Um, this is a report that uh, my staff and I put together regarding our QR procedure, which is something that uh, we've been using uh, relatively frequently here since uh, late last year. Um, and in the interest of um, just making sure that everyone is on the same page about how this will, will go and how we envision it going, we thought it would be helpful to put together this document. And so I, I don't feel the need to, um, to read this into the record as it's been in our briefing book now for some time. However, I would just uh, quickly summarize it for you. So this document um, does include um, just a summary of our COP1, which uh, has the QR procedure there in italicized text and um, our interpretation of what that means. And then in the latter uh, part of the document, you see uh, several steps that we have ironed out here over the last uh, couple of months with the interest of uh, making sure that um, this, this QR procedure is done in a way that um, provides for clear uh, expectations about how, how we will go about um, handling this internally, um, our expectations of interacting with you all to receive um, approval of any letters that are crafted and how we intend to submit it um, after those steps have been uh, completed. So um, after consulting uh, with my staff, we don't think that this would take a uh, change to the COPs. This is more about expectation management and our intentions. I do want to make sure that this was in front of you so that you can uh, see how, how we intend to proceed and um, would be happy to uh, answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Of course, if you would like to uh, make modifications to the COPs, that is certainly within your um, within your authority. Um, however, uh, we, we don't think that's necessary at the moment. So I think I will uh, stop there, Mr. Chairman. Happy to answer any questions about the QR procedure and maybe just one final note that looking out along the horizon, we do anticipate using this procedure uh, quite a bit moving forward uh, for the wind energy matter and for aquaculture matters. Um, and that uh, this will keep coming back. So we want to be on the same page about how we envision moving forward. All right, thanks for that, Merrick. And I think you're right. I think the QR procedure will become more routine than it has been in the past. Let's see if there are any questions for the executive director or any discussion. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Burden, for your overview and summary of the document. I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, my appreciation for the work that you and your staff have done to um, scrutinize our process and add some transparency to it. Um, this is a great reminder and just wanting to um, indicate that um, the description here is in line with um, what I've always understood our QR response procedure to be. Um, so just appreciate 
um, uh, taking the time to summarize it. Um, I do have one question and that pertains to uh, the item one um, describing the consultation that occurs between council staff and the leadership of an appropriate committee on the need for a QR letter. Um, one, I guess my question is, would it be more appropriate to indicate um, that committees could be plural throughout the document? And, and the reason I raise that is there are a number of issues that are kind of cross-cutting across committees. And, and actually, most issues are cross-cutting across committees. Um, but I just flag that, uh, acknowledging that um, we may take up content in one committee, and it would be an unfortunate situation to have, uh, as an example, um, content that's been in a Habitat Committee discussion then fall only to the consultation of the MPC. So I guess that's kind of a question and a comment. Um, do we foresee that committee here in the report really should be broadened to include committees? Thanks. Yes, thank you, Ms. Yeremko. Uh, um, I think your, your comment and question is uh, well noted. Um, I would just, just note that it's the intention, uh, even though it doesn't say plural, it's the intention that we would uh, consult with either a singular committee, if that's appropriate, or more than one committee, if that seems appropriate. Um, I, I believe our, let's see, what letter was that? Our, I believe our Nordic Aqua Farms letter consulted both the Habitat Committee and the MPC, for instance. So um, I would just add that I, I believe the intention is to do what you are uh, suggesting, even though the, the text is singular. Hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Burden. All right, uh, further questions? Any discussion on this uh, proposal or this clarification from staff. All right, I'm not seeing any hands. And uh, so we'll move on to the next bullet here and that is to discuss whether the council wishes to consider changes or additions to the COPs or SOPPs. Um, and Okay, Maggie Summer, please. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, I don't have a change to suggest, just a question I think for staff. Um, we have noticed that the version of COP9 on the council's website uh, does not yet reflect the um, update that the council uh, approved to include the um, central subpopulation of Northern Anchovy Management Framework last November and just wanted to, to check in on that. Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Summer. That is just simply uh, something I have not gotten to. It is on my list. I was hoping to get that done before March uh, with CPS on the agenda at our next meeting. Uh, we'll endeavor to get that uh, posted. It's just simply something we, ha we haven't got to. My apologies. Thanks very much. No, no problem. I understand there has been an awful lot of transition and, and going on. So appreciate the info. Okay. Further discussion about potential changes or additions to these documents. Are we not getting any direction? And if we're not getting any direction, I'm fine to leave it there. Mike, do you have anything? Uh, nothing more. I think that concludes our business here. We'll move forward with the appointments you've made. Uh, welcome to those folks, and we will get you teed up for 
uh, some June discussions about the vacancies and maybe some further uh, looks at your COPs. I don't anticipate a lot of business uh, for April just because it's, it's right around the corner. So this should be a relatively short agenda item at your next session, but thank you. All right, thank you very much. And that concludes uh, two out of three administrative items. Um, and we'll move on now to agenda item C7, uh, future council meeting agenda and wor workload planning. And I'll turn to Merrick. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's see, after discussing this uh, with my deputy, I think it'd be most helpful if, uh, if Mike could uh, walk us through how the uh, agenda has for April has changed since the last time you've seen it and proceed that way. Yeah, and just, just the overview, and then um, we've got a number of reports and we'll come to council, we'll, we'll come to public comment, if any, and then council discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Executive Director Burden. Uh, C7 is our typical look at uh, our next meeting, as well as a look at our next five council meetings with the year at a glance. Uh, in your briefing materials for this, you uh, should have found yesterday Supplemental Attachment 3, which is a revised version of the year at a glance. It takes a five meeting look at what's ahead uh, with a couple of uh, reflections that we've heard uh, this week. I'll go through those in a minute here. We also have C7 Supplemental Attachment 4, which is a revised version of the April Council meeting with a couple of small changes thus far regarding that session. Um, I will note that the, the Federal Register notice for the April meeting is due today, so we're trying to minimize changes there, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll happy to hear what folks have to say and do our best to respond as quickly as possible. But as everyone is well aware, that meeting uh, is looming. So we also, uh, as the Chair Garonic pointed out, have a variety of advisory body statements here. Uh, we have an SSC report, an HMS management team report, an HMS advisory subpanel report, ground fish management team report, a ground fish advisory subpanel report, uh, ad hoc ecosystem work group report, ecosystem advisory subpanel report, and a habitat committee report. I didn't take the time to go through presenters for all those because it's my understanding that some of them are, are not online and I'm not sure which are, are or are not, but we have council staff, uh, uh, including myself, prepared to, to fill in if, if folks aren't online there. Uh, last I looked, I don't think we had public comments, but uh, we'll check again and make sure that's the case. Um, so uh, I can briefly run through uh, the changes that have occurred to the future meeting documents I just mentioned. Then I suggest we go through those advisory body uh, statements and public comment, hear what folks have to say about those meetings before we get into substantive council discussions of, of how, to, uh, how to move forward there, if that's okay with you. It does sound like a plan. So unless there are any questions, um, were you going to review the changes first before we go through advisory body? Yes, okay. just, just briefly. I, if I could, I'll start with April. Um, not a lot of changes here. You'll see uh, for Tuesday, April 12th, we had planned for a one hour session to begin scoping a strategic plan for ground fish. Uh, I went back and looked at the November uh, transcripts and such. I, I, I saw some mixed support for that. Uh, I conferred with our ground fish staff to see whether we are ready for that. But basically what uh, the conclusion I came to is that uh, if there's interest in moving forward with this item, uh, it's, it's April's just perhaps not the best timing giving it right in the middle of specs and it's coming up quickly. So uh, I have recommended we remove this from the April meeting and we'll see on the year to glance, I've, I've penciled it in for a September session uh, after we get past uh, the specs process. Uh, and I'd be interested in any council feedback if that's not the way anyone wants to move forward. I also, uh, in November, we heard there's some interest in perhaps expanding this to a to a bigger picture sort of strategic plan for the council. Again, I don't see that ripe for April, uh, but interested in the ideas as we look uh, further down the year. Um, one other minor change here, we've been working with the US Coast Guard to receive their annual report. Uh, we are planning to be up in Seattle and the Coast Guard would like to involve uh, the Rear Admiral in, in this presentation. So we've been uh, working with them to schedule that. Uh, we tentatively have that penciled in for Tuesday the 12th. We understand that might be might work for their schedule, but we're working with them today to iron that out. So that, that might move a little bit, but I don't anticipate it shaking up uh, the order of April too much. Um, 
I think we'll hear some other comments from our advisory bodies regarding some potential other modifications to April, uh, but we'll I hold off till we hear that and have those discussions a little bit later. Uh, regarding the year at a glance, uh, I've, I've made a few additions there uh, for your consideration here. Uh, they are shown in underline and strike out the changes. Uh, so I guess starting with April, about the only one that there to, to take note of is again, I've struck in the uh, strategic plan for now and you'll see it underlined in September as a candidate agenda item. And again, I welcome any council feedback uh, on that process. Uh, regarding coastal pelagic species, you'll see underlined uh, a preliminary and final uh, process scheduled for your June and November 2022 meetings to address the assessment terms of reference. Recall under uh, the groundfish agenda item on this topic at this meeting, there was interest in pulling the CPS portions of, of those terms of reference documents out and creating a standalone document. I think you'll hear from the SSC, there are plans to work with their CPS subcommittee and the advisory bodies uh, to bring something back for you to look at in a preliminary fashion in June with a final adoption uh, in November. In addition, I added methodology review topics uh, to the November 2022 meeting. I think that was just an oversight on my part earlier. Um, regarding ground fish, I, again, I mentioned the strategic plan. I'm moving that to September. Uh, I also got word um, that the SSC and our ground fish staff are recommending that that assessment methodology review approval get moved to November. I meant to show that striked out as a strikeout in September. My apologies there, but the idea would be to move that to November. As we'll probably hear from the SSC, there are plans. Uh, late in 2022 to uh, dig into some of the ROV surveys for groundfish and, and look at those methodologies in their application to, uh, to assessments. And so it would be uh, just more advantageous timing if the council took up the results of all that uh, in November. Getting a little deep into the assessment cycle there, but I think it would be behoove the council in the process uh, to, to delay that one meeting. Um, and I guess the last thing I will note on the year at a glance, if you look at June down in the administrative column uh, back in November, National Marine Fisheries Service finished up some policy directives regarding uh, council financial disclosures uh, and recusal policy. Uh, and they would like to circle back with the council and, and review that with you. Uh, the, the documents are out and there's, there's some concepts perhaps of putting those uh, in April as an informational item just so people can start orient them to it. But uh, I believe National Marine Fisheries Service is recommending perhaps a uh, June discussion uh, of those policies. So that wraps up my overview of what's changed thus far. Um, or no, I guess there's one other thing I was gonna mention, if I could please, on the non-trawl RCA piece, uh, talking with my staff and National Marine Fishery Service and others, uh, there's good progress uh, on that. That's teed up for your April meeting, uh, but uh, staff is recommending that we modify this schedule slightly so that uh, at your next session here in April, we'll just take a revisit the range of alternatives and perhaps modify those. Uh, it's my understanding that the state of those alternatives and the analysis isn't quite uh, ready enough for the council to entertain a preliminary preferred alternative at your next meeting. So we've uh, scheduled that preliminary preferred alternative uh, for September uh, and would look to the council as you move, move through those two uh, sessions as terms of where uh, final action on that might fall. So. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, uh, that's my overview of the new information on those two planning documents, uh, and I recommend we turn to our advisory bodies and public comment before we get into council discussion of that too much. All right, thanks very much, Mike. Um, let's see if there are any questions of Mike. We'll come to council discussion later, of course. All right, I'm not seeing any hands, so we'll start with advisory bodies, and um, if uh, the member isn't here to give the report. I'd ask the staff officer to step up and provide it. So we'll start with the SSC report. Uh, Dr. Galen Johnson. Uh, hi, th uh, this is Dan Holland, uh, vice chair of the SSC. I think I'll be reading the statement uh, instead sure. of Galen. All right, welcome, Dan. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'd like to, to uh, read agenda item C7A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, uh, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. Uh, there's also a table attached to, to this that has the, the uh, items. The Scientific Statistical Committee discussed workload planning and has the following updates to our November 2021 statement under this agenda item. 
the SSC recommends two meetings to discuss proposed changes to two separate stock assessment terms of reference for groundfish and the coastal pelagic CPS. The SSC groundfish subcommittee proposes to meet via webinar in April to discuss the groundfish TOR and the SSC CPS subcommittee proposes to meet via webinar in April or early May to discuss the developments for the CPS TOR. Members of the groundfish and CPS management teams and advisory subpanels are encouraged to participate in these meetings. The revisions to the TOR for groundfish stock assessment is scheduled for final review by the council in June 2022, while the review of the CPS TOR is slated for initial review in June and final review in November. The seventh national meeting of the scientific coordination subcommittee of the council coordination committee uh, SCS7 is scheduled for August 15th through the 17th in Sitka, Alaska. The meeting will generally explore fishery management adaptations to climate change. Dr. Andre Punt has been invited to be a keynote speaker and other SSC members anticipated to attend include doctors Christian Marshall, Melissa Haltuch, Galen Johnson, Teresa Sue, and possibly myself, Dan Holland. Uh, the SSC will keep the council apprised of the plans for the SCS7 meeting as they are decided. The SSC recommends continuing to convene the annual SSC ecosystem subcommittee meeting with the CCIEA team to review additions to the IEA report in September. Uh, the SSC recommends inviting the SSC Salmon Subcommittee, Salmon Technical Team, and Salmon Advisory Panel to the September SSC ES meeting, since one of the recommended topics is specifically relevant to salmon management. The salmon topic could be scheduled in the afternoon so that those attending for that topic need only attend a half day. The SSC recommends holding the annual salmon methodology review in mid-October. And the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee is planning a number of additional meetings and workshops over the next several months. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee is planning a workshop to discuss alternative harvest control rules for spiny dogfish to reflect its lower productivity and the finding from the most recent assessment that the SPR 50% harvest rate may not be sustainable. Dates for that workshop are yet to be determined. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee is planning to meet in late June or early July to review the template model builder implementation of a species distribution model to generate biomass indices, along with a workshop on the treatment of indices for hook and line survey. In order to accommodate WDFW fieldwork schedules, the WDFW hook and line survey data and index development will be discussed at a subsequent fall meeting. The fall meeting will build on the recommendation from the early summer meeting. Pairing the template model builder methodology review with the hook and line data and index development workshops will reduce the number of meetings and reports and provide time for proponents to work on requests while other topics are discussed. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee proposes a planning meeting in late July or early August to coordinate aging prioritization and catch estimation to inform groundfish stock assessments, prioritize for review in 2023, the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee proposes conducting a workshop in late August to explore approaches for modeling large closed areas and other regulation changes in upcoming groundfish stock assessments. And finally, the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee recommends a meeting in late September to discuss the integration of ROV survey data in assessments and to review ODFW's proposed acoustic ROV survey methodology for semi-pelagic rockfish with participation of a Center for Independent Expert Scientists on acoustic abundance estimation methods. The outcomes of the three aforementioned methodology review and workshop meetings will inform the groundfish stock assessment accepted practices. That concludes my statement. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Are there questions for Dan? Mercy Remco. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Holland. Really appreciate uh, the SSC report here. A uh, number of really critical items um, described here in your report, and I just can't thank you enough for prioritizing uh, a number of the groundfish items that are shown in the table. Um, just want to note how important it will be to have a planning meeting early to conduct the aging or to coordinate the aging prioritization to inform the stock assessments that are prioritized for 23. I, I very much support that and very much appreciate um, your mention of it here. 
um, as well as the workshop scheduled for August to explore modeling uh, closed areas uh, and how that plays into stock assessments. Uh, and then finally, the uh, review of the ROV um, methodologies. I think that's a, a hugely important topic and, and further integration of ROV data into our stock assessments. Uh, the work is coming along and we certainly um, are looking to that survey method to better inform um, a number of our stock assessments. So I just want to echo um, my appreciation for the list of tasks and, and just noting how full your plate is. Um, I do have a question in the discussion about the uh, CCIEA team meeting and the development of the report that I, sounds like is in September. Um, the SSC is recommending inviting the salmon subcommittee, the STT, and the SAS uh, to the ecosystem subcommittee meeting. Since one of the recommended topics is specifically relevant to salmon management, um, sounds like you're proposing a half a day discussion with those groups. And I'm just um, before supporting agendizing. Um, a large chunk of time for a joint discussion. I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about what that recommended topic is. Um, okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, just let, let me bring that up. Um, it was in the, uh, the proposed topics that they put forward and probably the easiest thing for me to do is um, just kind of paraphrase it, but the, the topic of the of this of the of that topic was a broad strategic review of the salmon indicator portfolio. So there are a number of different um, indicators that relate to salmon uh, that are in the IEA, uh, the annual IEA status report, including the stoplight charts. Um, there are some other indicators that show, um, I, I believe, like that sort of maximum flow in the um, in rivers uh, and um, you know they're now the stoplight charts for both um, kind of Columbia River stocks as well as as the Sacramento. Um, so there's a there's a whole suite of um, different indicators in in that uh, and in the report. And the idea here, I think, is to go through those, try to find out which ones are useful, to see if people have concerns about any of them. Um, and if there are, you know, ways to perhaps uh, do more work to, to see how meaningful they are in terms of actually predicting outcomes. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Holland. Yes, it does. And that sounds like a, a very good idea. And I'm sure the STT and the SAS will appreciate the opportunity to engage in that. Thanks for the clarification. You're welcome. All right. Further questions on the SSC report? Thank you very much, Dr. Holland. You're welcome. We'll go to the groundfish management team report. I'm not sure if that's Katie Pearson or not, but we'll find out shortly. Good morning. It is Katie Pearson. Good morning. Um, so I will be reading Supplemental GMT Report 1, Groundfish Management Team Report on Future Council Meeting, Agenda, and Workload Planning. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the draft year at a glance and draft April agenda contained in the advanced briefing book, as well as the status of ongoing projects, and offers the following for consideration by the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Workload prioritization implications. Based on council action under agenda item E3, stock definitions, and agenda item E6, workload prioritization and new management measures, the council has prioritized work on an amendment to the groundfish fishery management plan to define stocks and reorganize stock complexes. This is going to be a multi-step process requiring additional expertise outside of the GMT, which may require additional facilitation and coordination. Therefore, the council will want to clarify, ooh, carefully, 
consider when to schedule actions on this item. It is worth noting that most, if not all of the ground fish items listed in, the, in Appendix 2, Table A of the Workload Prioritization List, Agenda Item B6, are and currently prioritized are expected to be completed and or go into regulation by 2023, potentially freeing up GMT time for other emerging issues, including stock definitions and stock complex reexamination. Here I will pause and note that in the uh, briefing book, this sentence is in there twice for some reason. So please just strike the second one out of your mind. Um, that said, there are agenda items that have been worked on by others, example, council staff or National Marine Fishery Service. And until directed by the council to start looking into those items, the GMT cannot estimate what our workload might be, example, fixed gear logbooks. Transitioning back to in-person meetings. The GMT is ready to meet in person, provided that the whole team is able to do so, and sees immense benefit to meeting in person in April and or June, as those are important meetings for the 2023-24 harvest specifications and management measures cycle, and the first time much of the team would be meeting each other. Regardless of when in-person meetings resume, the GMT reminds everyone to take into account travel days when planning briefings or meetings that are covering topics of interest across multiple advisory bodies. April agenda. Regardless of whether the GMT meets in person, the GMT su suggests that it would be beneficial to meet for an extra day before the April meeting, meeting on Thursday, April 7th. This will help facilitate the many complex topics that the GM2 will be presenting to the council, most notably the harvest specifications and management measures analytical document. GMT year at a glance. The GMT was unable to discuss the council's year at a glance after the workload prioritization and new management measures agenda item due to competing items on the floor and GMT scheduling. Therefore, the GMT chose not to provide a GMT YAG at this time and will revisit that exercise in April when we have an updated council priorities, prioritized list of ground fish items. For the June council meeting, at least, the GMT recommends the following items should be scheduled with formatting clarified below. The NIMS report, in-season management, workload and new management measures, final stock assessment plan and tour, fisheries in 2023-24 management measures FPA, and final EFP approval. Uh, we recommend um, strike, so bolded with strike through to reflect that those shaded on the YAG with the GMT uh, recommends moving to a later date is the trawl catch share review scoping and bold and italicized items that are those the GMT recommends unshading on the council YAG are the Sablefish gear switching update and the uh, limited entry fixed gear program review final. And that concludes our statement. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions of the team? Mike Berner and Heather Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Katie. Uh, the GMT report reminded me I failed to note one other addition to the, your supplemental YAG regarding stock definitions. I put down a scoping session there just as a candidate item, but I didn't see it on the list of uh, the GMT recommendations here. I apologize if I missed something. So sorry, I missed it. My overview and just a question about um, how we might move forward with that process. Heather? Thank you, Chair Grelnick, and um, thank you, Katie, for the GMT's report. I had a question about um, if the GMT um, was concerned at all about having agenda item F4, the 23-24 uh, specs and management measures um, on back-to-back -back days. So right now it's scheduled on Monday and then coming back again on Tuesday and um, just wasn't sure if it would, if you talked about um, whether or not it'd be beneficial to have a, a break between those two agenda items or part A and 
part B or part one and two, how we used to call it. Um, I know if you were to move the F4, the first one earlier in the week, it might uh, reduce the amount of time you had to prepare for that. Um, but a break in between might give you time to respond to any questions that come up from the council. So just wondered if you talked about that at all. Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Hall. Um, we neglected to talk at length about that, um, but I would say you are correct. That is a fine line between having us uh, have more time to prepare uh, versus um, uh, respond to any council uh, questions. But without talking to the team, what I would say is that if we were to schedule, be scheduled for the 7th, uh, that would give us more time to prep for the first, um, and then that could potentially be moved up uh, to allow for more room. But really, I think uh, we need a sufficient amount of time um, to talk before the first agenda item, if, if that helps. It does, Katie. Thank you. Any further questions of Katie? All right. I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, so thank you, Katie, for the report. We'll now go to the gap. I have Susan Chambers down as the giver of the report. Good morning, uh, Chair Gorelnik and council members. <clears throat> My name is Susan Chambers, and I will be reading the Ground Fish Advisory Panel Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. This is our revised GAP Report 1. <clears throat> the GAP reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments and recommendations. Overarching comments. The GAP notes much of the April and June Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings overlap with the North Pacific uh, Fishery Management Council meetings. We realize the transition to virtual meetings due to the COVID-19 pandemic created scheduling difficulties. <clears throat> scheduling in-person meetings as we transition out of the pandemic is undoubtedly as challenging, especially with regard to scheduling hotels. However, many of our ground fish members participate in both North Pacific and Pacific fisheries, and they would like to stay engaged in the management processes in both areas. <clears throat> the GAP requests the council remain cognizant of potential conflicts and avoid them if possible. We appreciate the council's perseverance during the pandemic to accommodate the council, advisory bodies, and the public through virtual meetings. Regarding the April 2022 agenda, uh, referencing the draft meeting agenda for April, the GAP recommends adding a marine planning agenda item to the agenda. Advisory bodies, the public, and the council spoke to the importance of this issue under agenda item C.2, marine planning especially since the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management recently released the Oregon call areas and is expected, it is expected a formal federal register notice will be announced soon with a comment period that overlaps the April council meeting. Additionally, the ad hoc Marine Planning Committee plans to meet in early April to help inform the council regarding three items, the Oregon call areas, comments related to an imminent announcement of a draft Morro Bay Wind Energy Area Environmental Assessment, <clears throat> and the U.S. Coast Guard Pacific Access Route Study. The GAP suggests including a narrowly focused marine planning agenda item for April. <clears throat> council and council-related meetings in 2022. Referencing the preliminary year-to-glance calendar under this agenda item, the GAP recommends the following adding a stock definitions agenda item to the year to glance calendar, which I see in supplemental has already been done. The council identified this as a priority under agenda item E.3, stock definitions, and the gap supports scheduling that item. Um, we also suggest retaining or unshading the gear switching item for the June agenda. This issue has been ongoing for several years and the gap would like to continue the momentum to move it forward. <clears throat> Lastly, moving forward with a workshop on acoustic surveys, remotely operated or autonomous underwater vehicle surveys, or other, re or other fisheries independent surveys that could be used in closed areas, such as MPAs, 
rockfish conservation or cow cod conservation areas and nearshore areas that are difficult to access by other means. The data from those kinds of surveys could be critical to informing stock assessments in the future. The GMT addressed this in the GMT Supplemental Report 1 under E8 stock assessments. The GAP also noted this in our E8A Supplemental GAP Report 1. A workshop is tentatively planned for August. We recommend this workshop proceed as planned. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my comments and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, right, thank you, Susan. Look for any questions from around the council table or in amongst our virtual attendees. And I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much for your statement. We'll now go to the HMSAS. I believe Mike Conroy is giving that statement. I am confirming you can hear me. Indeed. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. My name is Mike Conroy, and I'll be reading in to the record the revised HMSAS report on agenda item C7. The HMSAS notes there are a number of substantial HMS items on the June Council meeting agenda, including international issues and selection of the DGN hard caps preliminary preferred alternative. With respect to the international issues, further, further development of a North Pacific albacore harvest strategy by the Northern Committee is expected, and the ISC is conducting a full benchmark stock assessment for Pacific bluefin, which could influence current stock rebuilding measures. Given these topics, the HMSAS recognizes that some items may have to be deferred to the September Council meeting. The AS also requests a one-day online meeting before the June Council meeting, this would help the AS begin developing reports that would be further developed and finalized as part of its regular meeting occurring in conjunction with the June Council meeting. There are issues beyond HMS, such as marine planning and ecosystem, that are occurring with increasing frequency on Council agendas. In some cases, the AS has had limited opportunities to develop recommendations for these items based on how they are scheduled on the Council agenda. For example, at this meeting, marine planning, agenda item C2, is on the agenda the day following the start of the HMAS, HMS AS meeting, giving limited time to develop a report absent advance work by email. Having a one day online meeting a week in advance of the council meeting would help the AS in this regard. Given the high likelihood of items of interest being discussed in April related to marine planning, the HMS AS recommends the council add marine planning to the April agenda. For example, publication in the Federal Register of call areas off Oregon, a draft EA for the Morro Bay wind energy area, and an NOI to prepare a programmatic EIS for aquaculture opportunity areas off Southern California. Um, the ad hoc marine planning committee is planning to meet on the afternoon of April 5th and the HMS AS would request a one day online meeting of the HMS AS be scheduled shortly thereafter to allow the council to receive our comments and or recommendations on items the council may be considering or discussing. And that concludes our report, thanks. Thanks very much, Mike. Are there any questions of Mike on the AS report? Thank you, Mike. We'll now go to the ecosystem advisory sub panel. And if there's no one from the EAS, uh, perhaps I could ask the staff officer. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Good morning, Michelle, we can hear you, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll be reading from agenda item C7A supplemental EAS report one. The EAS discussed future council meeting agendas and workload planning at our uh, meeting on March 9th and would like to offer the following comments. The EAS discussed the benefit of a formal opportunity to participate in the SSC's annual review of revisions to the indicators included in the IEA annual report as proposed in agenda item H3 public comment. While EAS members can observe the SSC's review in September, it is focused more on the technical details raised by the uh, IEA team. 
So rather than attend the SSC meeting, the EAS believes that engaging with the IEA team separately to discuss revisions to indicators and how ecosystem information is packaged and presented to the Council for the following March meeting could further the EAS's understanding of the annual report and help ensure it is the most useful for Council management. To facilitate this, the EAS would prefer to invite the IEA team to meet with us either prior to or in conjunction with our September meeting. The EAS had a robust discussion about workload, acknowledged that the scope of ecosystem related issues that affect council fisheries is increasing and discussed the timing of those issues relative to our usual meeting schedule, which is in March and September and our capacity to have more meetings. The EAS typically reviews and comments on the Council's research and data needs, currently scheduled for June, and we noted that the planned transition to the online database would likely allow us to identify priorities and provide updates with relatively low impact to our workload. For other items, such as marine planning, some members felt that it could be beneficial for the EAS to receive updates and potentially comment on those items. Notably, as climate and other ecosystem items become more broadly considered by the Council, for example, in the context of stock assessments, some EAS members identified those as an opportunity for the EAS to provide input, even though these may not be explicitly identified as ecosystem items. While the EAS is committed to be responsive to council identified priorities that the council believes would benefit from EAS engagement or advice, even if such requests fall outside of the EAS's current schedule, the EAS was generally concerned that this could result in a significant increase in our overall workload and would appreciate the council taking that into consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. Let me see if there are any questions of the EAS. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much. We'll now go to the Ecosystem Work Group. Yvonne Good morning. Durbin. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the Council. This is Yvonne Good morning. Durbin. I'll be reading from our report at C7A. The Ecosystem Work Group reviewed the proposed ecosystem management agenda items on the Council's preliminary year at a glance summary and offers the following recommendation. Unshade the Fishery Ecosystem Plan Initiatives update for September and revise to include final adoption of the updated FEP appendix. Based on the Council's discussion under H2 at this meeting, the ecosystem status report and science review topics, the ecosystem work group plans to work with the California current integrated ecosystem assessment team to develop ecosystem status report word and figure limits that better support report automation than the current 20 page limit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? All right, thank you very much, Yvonne. We'll now go to the Habitat Committee, Corey Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Can you hear me? We can. Right, I'm reading from agenda item seven, C7A, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1, Committee Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. In order to address the Pacific Fishery Management Council request for input on habitat indicators for Central Valley Chino uh, Spring Chinook, the Habitat Committee anticipates engaging with members of the Salmon Technical Team, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Southwest and Northwest Fishery Science Centers, as it did to generate the first set of habitat indicators. In addition to preparation during the spring, we expect some of this work to occur during the June and September 2022 Council meetings. The National Marine Fisheries Service West Coast Regional Office is hoping for efforts to be relatively complete in the fall with a report ready for the November meeting. The Habitat Committee is developing a proposed letter 
on the Klamath Dam environmental impact statement for consideration at the April Council meeting. In addition, the HC will continue supporting the development of policy guidance documents related to ocean development activities, as well as supporting comment letters on Oregon call areas and NOAA aquaculture opportunity areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. Are there questions for Corey on the Habitat Committee report? Thank you, Corey. And now uh, we'll hear from the highly migratory species management team, Steve Stowes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, I will be reading Supplemental HMSMT Report 1, Highly Migratory Species Management Team Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. The team reviewed the proposed scheduling of HMS agenda items on the uh, Council's preliminary year-at-a-glance summary and offers the following comments for Council consideration. <clears throat> Essential fish habitat should remain shaded until funding is secured to complete phase two of the HMS EFH review. To adequately focus on other scheduled agenda items for June, the swordfish management and monitoring plan should be postponed to a later council meeting. And the team requests council prioritization of the current June agenda items, specifically the Griff Gillnet bycatch performance report and Drift Gillnet hard cap preliminary preferred alternative agenda items, given the analytical requirements to complete these tasks. Based on council prioritization, the team may need to schedule an interim meeting prior to June in order to complete either of these tasks. That's the end of our report, and I'll take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Steve, are there any questions on the HMS MT report? John Ugritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Dr. Stowes, for the report. Um, quick question regarding leaving uh, the EFH shaded for June. Do you or the team anticipate that funding will become available in, in April? I'm just wondering why not just move it at this point? Um, why not just move it to April? Or, I no, mean, I'm you, sorry. Move it, move it further, that. move it further off than June. Because uh, if the issue is funding and we don't anticipate funding to be available by April, uh, wouldn't it make more sense to move it further out now and keep it shaded? Yeah, we didn't uh, discuss the scheduling other than to note that, as far as we know, there's no funding available, and we don't know that the but. We, we don't really have any idea when funding may become available. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions of the management team? Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. All right, that completes our reports. Uh, there is no public comment. So that will take us to council discussion and action, which is uh, there on the screen in front of all of us. So at this point, I will turn to our executive director to pick up the discussion. Or Mike, Mr. Berner. Mr. Berner, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I, I might recommend that we start with the April session since we have that FR notice due soon and that the sooner staff gets a picture of, of what that might look like, uh, it would make things a little easier for us to get that turned around. Uh, I, I, I might also ask the council might want to extend that discussion to talk a little bit about uh, COVID protocols and uh, some of the uh, logistics for that April meeting. Uh, once we get April, uh, settled, if you will, uh, then maybe turn the discussion to uh, post-April uh, activities and the year at a glance, if that makes sense to the council. So 
I think that's an excellent plan. First things first. If that does, let's let's focus on April. Uh, I didn't hear any support uh, in our advisory body statements for uh, maintaining that strategic plan scoping item for April, uh, and I haven't heard anything around the table thus far. So unless I hear differently, we'll go ahead with postponing that uh, until potentially your September uh, agenda item. Um, there was uh, several references to perhaps scheduling a marine planning item in April. Uh, I would note that um, this April agenda has uh, been around for a while and it's it's getting pretty complete. And as I noticed, uh, we, we, we generally don't have the ability to change this agenda a lot, but if the councilor uh, felt that was a high priority, uh, we could look to, to fitting that in somewhere. Um, I would also, we also heard from the GMT uh, and, and Heather Hall regarding the potential of moving some of those ground fish items to provide some more time between those two check-ins or excuse me, the two, the two step approach to uh, management measure PPA. Um, again, I would entertain that, but the, the things, once you start shuffling things around, it starts a cascade effect. So uh, just a little bit of concern about tinkering with this agenda too much, but uh, I don't want to squelch ideas either. So uh, open to council discussion and comments on April and how it's how it's laid out. Right, thanks, Mike. Well, let's see if there's some guidance from around the table, particularly with regard to the Marine Planning Committee request, which we heard from a couple of different um, advisory bodies. See if there's any support for that. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Karen Braby. Good morning, everyone. I, I don't wanna speak for or against it, but I just wanna provide some considerations for the marine planning um, item. There are a couple of weighty uh, topics that will be timely at the April meeting. And there has been some uh, concern about the use of a QR letter approach instead of scheduling council time uh, to address uh, emerging marine planning issues. Um, I believe that the council's process on this, um, even with the heavy reliance on QR letters has worked just fine, um, but recognize the, the workload and, and that there, it's, it's tough to get a formal council consideration of those um, through that QR process. So I'm, I, me personally, as a council member, I'm fine either way, but recognize and just wanted to articulate the pros and cons of trying to make time for that at the April agenda. All right, thank you very much for that comment. Further discussion? Uh, Phil Anderson. Yeah, this doesn't isn't a suggestion to modify the agenda, but I just wanted to make note of the GMT's um, request that for an extra day before the meeting starts to help them uh, meet the workload demands that they have. Thank you, Phil, for that reminder. Heather Hall, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on um, Phil's comment about that too. And um, I think, uh, and as it pertains to what we heard from um, Mike about the revising the schedule and, and just with the hope that if the GNT had more lead time, it might accommodate that um, issue that I raised about those two agenda items being um, back to back. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Oh, Coast Guard. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I um, just wanted to speak to the agenda item I-1, uh, the Coast Guard Annual Report. Uh, there was a proposed date change from Friday to Tuesday. We're prepared to support that Tuesday morning uh, date change. Uh, we've had some correspondence with Mr. Jim Siegert uh, via email, um, and he's confirmed that date as well, um, and the Admiral is planning to present. Um, we will not be reading the entire report into record, um, but we will likely be presenting some level of uh, slide deck to present to the Council. That's all I have. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have strong feelings, but I do lean towards planning a short agenda item for marine planning in April. Um, if that seems reasonable and doesn't unnecessarily, and I, I don't want to, um, sorry, Mr. Burner, I can't remember the exact word you just used. <laughs> but I don't want to a cascade. I think that was it. I don't want to start a cascade here, um, but I think a short agenda item would allow some space. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces as Dr. Bravey spoke to. Um, and I think it's important that this this council gets time to think about those. So thanks. Thank you. I think my, my concern is I've never heard of a short green planning uh, committee agenda item. They seem to be scheduled at two hours and go to three hours. So um, while I think that would be that suggestion is ideal, it's also a bit idealistic. Um, we do have the quick response method available. Um, should we need to provide some letters? Um, but let's just sort of see if, if there's any strong council interest in scheduling a, a Marine Planning Committee item. And if there is, we're gonna have to rejigger a fair amount of stuff. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman and, and I, um, you know, if, if there was a longer time period between March and April, where, I, I mean, I know it's a real active suite of things that are going on in that world. Um, and um, however, I, you know, we spent a good deal of time and got comprehensive updates at this meeting. Um, I, I would obviously, I would advocate that we certainly take it up in June, but because of the short shortness of the time period between the two meetings, I I guess I would suggest not trying to squeeze it into the April agenda. All right, thank you for that, Phil. Um, is that gonna be okay with folks? Okay, I think, I think that's where we're gonna have to go. Um, further discussion on the agenda for the April meeting, Ryan? Or, excuse me, uh, Brad Penger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Rolnick. Um, I'm just kind of curious. We've got, what are we, we have a few hours that are open here. Um, I see only two and a half hours on day last. Um, I guess it was it, was the desire to fill out that to four and a half hours or, or fill each day at, at eight, or are we happy with pretty much what we're seeing right now? Well, my recollection is that the last day of the April meeting with North of Falcon often takes a lot of time. And um, while I hope we don't have a repeat, there is always that possibility. So, um, and I think that Mr. Anderson made a fair point. We had an MPC meeting here and it was only a month between meetings and we, we might have an alternative mechanism to get out letters if we need to. Well, I wasn't necessarily advocating for an NPC meeting. I just was just okay. as far as the... Yeah, no, we do have that time. Okay. Phil. Well, I appreciate you pointing out that North Falcon is the area that uses, usually holds us up, <laughs> but um, South of Falcon this year is proving to be a big challenge as well. Yes. Um, and not to say that North Falcon won't rear its, um, its head before we're done, but I... I think giving ourselves a little bit of time and the potential of having to take the final action on day last instead of Tuesday as, as we hope to do here is, is, a, is a good strategy to give us a little bit of leeway there. So thanks. All right, thanks for that. Anything further, um, Maggie Summer and then Ryan Wolf. Thanks, Chair Grelnick. Um, we will also, I think, need to start thinking about a process to address the ground fish stock definitions and uh, stock complexes issue. And I know that we have a shaded item on the June agenda that we'll talk about when we get to the year at a glance in a little bit. Uh, but 
I think that we might want to be having some some discussions about an approach and potentially uh, uh, whether we think an ad hoc committee would be appropriate, et cetera, at the April meeting under um, one or both of membership appointments and future meeting planning. Okay, thank you for that, Maggie. Ryan? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Chair. And I support the comments just made by Maggie. Um, but I have actually two questions, and then I have another comment, but they're all on <laughs> different things. The first one actually is more about quick clarification, maybe to Mike, um, that under this agenda, so for D4, for the salmon, is that where you see where the, we would circle back on the Southern Resident Killer Whale threshold process recommendation from the STT and the SSC? Uh, that would certainly be one option if, if that item fell as a, as a topic that the council wanted to prioritize for methodology review. I could see that as a way forward for sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, and I apologize, my apologies if I miss, but looking at the GMT report and their request to meet in person in April, maybe question for Merrick on, on protocol is, are, are you expecting that this would be April would be similar to your email it would be a hybrid meeting just like this where you're only expecting the STT or the SAS or are we opening a meeting if all of the advisory body members want to be there in person or any clarification you have on that would be helpful thanks uh, yeah thank you Mr. Wolf um, Yes, the, the April meeting, um, unfortunately, we did have to make some decisions uh, about how to structure that meeting before we arrived here, in particular, um, you know, setting aside space at the hotel. So at the at the time of, of making those decisions, our understanding is that we would not have been able to fully staff many of our management teams in person. So the structure for the <clears throat> April meeting will be, in many ways, very similar to this one in an in-person setting with the council in person salmon bodies uh, in person. Um, we do have some more latitude to discuss some other um, other changes. Um, I, I, would, I would recommend we take that up after we go through the agenda. Um, but uh, the the ability to host the GMT in person is not is not within the realm of possibility at the moment. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And and I do have one more comment, but I guess it's actually more relevant to the YAG. So I'll, I'll hold up for now since we're on the April agenda. All right, Mike Berner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, regarding the recommendation regarding an ad hoc committee to look into some stock definition issues, I'm, I'm supportive of that. I think uh, April is coming up quickly, though, as we've mentioned several times. I think what might help with that agenda item, the council certainly under membership and appointments could establish an ad hoc committee. I think it might be helpful if we have in the briefing book at least some straw man ideas about what the charge of that committee, maybe what the membership of that might look like, just so people can start getting their mind around it. We wouldn't necessarily have to have names for the, the seats for that committee. Uh, that's something that the, the, the chair in council consultation with the council could do outside of a council session, but it might be good. I'd be happy to work with folks to get something in the briefing book just to get some initial thoughts on that. So thank you. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, further thoughts on items for the April agenda? Okay, uh, Mike, let me just turn to you and see if we're you've received enough input on that to finalize it and get the FR notice out. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate all that feedback. I plan to add a GMT session on, on the 7th as they requested to get to get some speed going on the large amount of workload they have. We're gonna leave strategic planning off. Uh, I understand we're, we will not be adding a marine planning session for the April council floor, but rely on our QR process and the good work of the ad hoc marine planning committee there. I got confirmation from the Coast Guard regarding that Tuesday scheduling. So um, with all that, I think we're, we're looking pretty good, good for April. We could turn to talk about maybe some of the protocols for April if there's more discussion there and then finish up with the year at a glance. So thank you. All right, thanks for that, Mike. And I'll, I'll turn to our executive director to get that discussion going. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, as indicated um, in my response to Mr. Wolf's question a minute ago, we, we have been thinking quite a bit about the, the April meeting. Um, and what I, would, what I would ask of you all is that uh, we try to achieve some, uh, some uh, collective uh, understanding or will about um, how to um, 
how to best manage that meeting in the face of COVID. Um, and so just a, a bit of background here. Um, so leading into this meeting, you know, we received several requests from, uh, from many of you about uh, uh, managing uh, COVID risks and, and that, that lent itself to masking requirements, testing requirements, um, limited in-person attendance, um, a, uh, 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 an effort to provide some spacing among us all here today and, and some, uh, some uh, other things. As we uh, head into uh, our April meeting, um, we currently have the same um, list of invitees, if you will. Um, so what I mean by that is we've, um, we have uh, 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 plans for being able to host the council in person, being able to host the two advisory bodies in person, um, being prepared to host tribal co-managers uh, in person, and um, uh, a couple of other uh, uh, folks around that process. Um, if, if we proceed with that, um, as we have been, we would expect there to be um, approximately 100 additional people at the April meeting compared to uh, this meeting here. Um, so that, that starts to look quite a bit different, even though our plan on paper looks fairly similar. Um, we also have questions for you all about um, what your uh, collective um, uh, desire is regarding uh, the management of our COVID situation and whether you would like to continue with a masking requirements. Um, in terms of testing, uh, I do not believe that we are uh, able at this point to require daily testing. We certainly have some tests still on hand um, and uh, the number is a fair number. And so I could imagine um, us providing those uh, to council members or salmon advisory members um, as requested, but the ability to require tests of the number of folks that we would anticipate having in April on a daily basis that doesn't look that feasible. So um, I think the question for you all here then is if we could have a discussion about um, uh, a few things. One is, uh, your um, your collective um, desires in terms of masking, vaccination, um, your uh, collective desire of whether to allow the public to attend in person or not. Uh, that's something that we did not allow here um, because um, it was a it was a, a point of risk that we wanted to manage. Um, given the relatively large number of people that we would expect in April. Um, I think that raises the question, should we go ahead and open up the meeting uh, to the public um, in person? So those are the, the three major questions that I would pose to you all. And uh, I hope that we can uh, try to achieve some collective will of the council here for April. I hope that makes sense, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions though. All right, thanks for laying that out. And let's see if uh, there's any, any questions or a discussion here. Marcy Remco. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Merrick, for that overview. Um, I guess maybe if you can clarify, I, I, I may have just missed it in what you just presented, but in a discussion about considering whether public may attend, um, that would be on their own time and dime and then with regard to any um a b members um that too would be on their own time and dime if they wish to attend or agency dime whatever the case may be i'm just looking for some clarification about who would be invited to attend Uh, yes, thanks for that question, uh, Mr. Remco. Um, so um, in terms of, uh, I believe your question is in regards to um, who would be invited and then who would be supported financially. Um, so uh, as we've done for this meeting um, with the council um, and the advisory bodies that have been invited, the, the two salmon bodies, we would be continued continuing to plan to support them in April as we have uh, in, in March. Um, in terms of the, the public, they, they would be, um, if, if you were to express 
uh, your desire to open up the meeting to the public. Um, you know, they would be expected to travel um, to the meeting if they desired and attend um, on their own dime as we, we do not uh, support the public participation. Um, in terms of uh, tribal co-managers, um, you know, we do hold um, uh, a room block that is available to them. Um, the, the actual degree of financial support, I'm drawing a blank. Um, this is where I'll pull the new guy card. I, I don't believe we do support the tribal co-managers financially, but um, we do uh, provide space in our room block for them. Um, I, I hope that's answering your question, Ms. Uremko. If I misunderstood it, uh, I'd be happy to clarify. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice or Mr. Chair and uh, Merrick. Actually, um, you're close. I guess I'm just wondering that if somebody is a member of an advisory body other than the SAS uh, or the STT, um, I just want to clarify that council funds would not be available for their travel if they were here to testify to us. So, for example, if the chair of the gap was to come to testify um, because it's open to the members of the public and the chair of the gap is a member of the public but also serves in another role as the chair of the gap um, funds would not be available for their attendance i i'm just looking for the the ground rules that would come with the authorization for public attendance. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that clarifying question, Mr. Remco. Um, so um, my, my intention would be that if, um, if a member of an advisory body were to attend um, and that advisory body had not been extended an invitation to attend in person, that that person would be participating as a member of the public uh, for purposes of our management of, of uh, the meeting. And so that would mean that we would um, not be supporting that person financially. I believe that's what you're asking. Yes, thank you, you got it. All right, Maggie Summer. Thanks Chair, I just wanted to uh, observe that they're really would seem to be a disconnect between not having most of our advisory bodies attend in person um, and yet opening up to uh, full public attendance. And I, I, I recognize there are a lot of, of aspects of both of those issues, uh, but it, it really yeah, there does seem to be a disconnect there. And I know many of our advisory bodies are, are really feeling the strain of, of not being in person. Uh, not sure I have a, a recommendation on this here, but thought I'd, I'd raise that and see if there's any uh, response around the table. Phil? Well, maybe as, uh, at least for me, what is possible? I mean, I mean, we're we're whatever we are, four weeks away or from the meeting. I assume you've made whatever hotel accommodations, meeting rooms, all that sort of thing. I mean, is what is the scope of the discussion here? What I mean, if we have a finite number of rooms that have been reserved based on the model that you described, Merrick, then discussing whether or not additional advisory bodies can attend and, and meet as they would normally do if, if we had an in-person meeting isn't an option as I understand it. And so if, if that, if my assumption there is correct, then my other question was, you mentioned that you thought there would be up to an additional 100 individuals attending the April meeting. And I'm wondering if we don't allow the public as we do, yes, if we same kind of model we did at this meeting and the one, well, the one addition, and I don't mean to minimize it, is that 
ma other management entities and, and in particular tribal management entities would be able to attend. Is that where the bulk of the additional people are coming from in your estimate of an increase of 100 people? Yes, that, thank you for that question, Mr. Anderson. And uh, also just quickly recognizing uh, Mag Maggie's question. Um, so um, let me see if I can address this in a couple of parts. So, um, so one, as we think about um, our full suite of council, council members and council advisory bodies, we did have to make a decision on uh, the hotel prior to the council meeting here this week. And so that, that was a, an unfortunate situation, but it, it just is what it, what it was, if that makes sense. Um, and so what we, um, what we understood at that time was that there would be several uh, members of various management teams that would decline to, to show in person. And so right away that, that meant that we would have to be entertaining um, hybrid models of some kind. Um, as we were thinking about this meeting, it was clear to us that we could only do that to a very limited extent. And so right away, that meant that we had to back down from a full in-person uh, um, April council meeting and entertain as many hybrid meetings as possible, which we thought would work here. And it, it hasn't quite worked even here. And so um, all of that led us to say, let's plan for advisory body invitations. The two advisory bodies we have here will make that same decision for the April meeting. So that's why the other management teams are, are not receiving an invitation. We then plan the hotel accordingly. And so we only have so many rooms, we can't scale that back up at this point. Um, and we also have uh, so many room blocks. Um, that gets to your second question. Um, and so, yes, indeed, the, the additional, um, the additional uh, participants in the meeting, my understanding is that uh, after communicating with folks at the uh, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, for instance, that we would be expecting somewhere between 60 or 70 additional folks from the tribes uh, coming to help with the tribal co-management process. Um, and then there's, a, I guess, a parallel uh, set of uh, folks that come from WDFW. You probably understand this better than I do. Put all that together and we start looking at about 100 people. Um, I think that's answering your question. Let me know if I missed anything. And I, I will note that uh, we had some public comment at least on the salmon side uh, of the public wanting to attend. So in terms of additional attendees to permit public participation, let me just say on the south of Falcon side, uh, we're not talking probably about very many additional people. Um, uh, and I, I don't think we're, you know, and I think that in terms of managing what happens in our bubble here in the council room, um, merely allowing the public to participate in the North of Falcon or South of Falcon processes outside this room is one thing. It doesn't necessarily mean we're bringing 100 members of the public into this room. We can still manage public comment as we have uh, through a virtual process and that would help protect our bubble here. Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks for all the clarification, it helped me a bunch, but um, my, my question is, at this meeting, at least the way I understood it, was we didn't prohibit anyone public from being here, we discouraged it, and it seemed to have worked. We didn't have any, very many public people here. And I would wonder, uh, are we doing the same, it, keeping that same protocol? And it seemed to have worked, because I, I don't, we don't have the ability to prohibit the public from coming in, I don't think. And could you clarify that? Thanks. Uh, yes, thanks, Mr. Dooley. Um, Let's see, thinking back on the correspondence that um, we sent out beginning late last year, um, we, uh, 
we made a decision to um, not allow the, the public to participate. And the actual formalities legally that might be what you're asking. Could we actually have stopped that? I'm not actually sure, but we tried really hard and sent reminders to folks that um, we were not anticipating or supporting public attendance. And there, there were a couple of folks that were here. Um, I'm, I'm not clear that they were members of the public. I think there were some tribal co-managers here for a few days, um, some members of the SAS. There might've been one or two people who I didn't recognize, but I think we were largely successful in um, not having people from the public that we did not extend an invitation to. Um, the question for you is whether you want to continue with that. I think we could allow the public or not discourage their attendance in April. We don't have room blocks or anything set up. We never do, but um, the one of the questions for you all is whether we should open our doors and allow the public to participate in person. Bob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mayor. I, I looked at the, the guidance that we publicly posted, that you posted, and it was, it was not lost on me that it was or discouraged, not prohibited. And I, I took that to mean that probably, and maybe assuming is wrong, but I assumed that we probably didn't have the ability to prohibit people from attending, but it certainly worked. And yes, there were people here today or this meeting that were not necessarily formally a member of the SAS or the SDT or any of those. And uh, I think that it was well, uh, I think people respected that request to be that. I would, I would assume given this short, um, the short time span between now and April, I was not thinking we'd be changing anything radically. And I think that worked. And uh, I think the testimony we heard virtually seemed to have been doing it for a couple of years now. So I don't have a problem with that. So I, I but then I would note too that ongoing this week, notwithstanding when the salmon uh, advisory bodies were in the room, but the rest of the meeting, we had 20 people in this huge room. So I think our exposure here is probably to any COVID protocols is minimal. I think that that's, so we should, I'd certainly like to get back to normal on that front. Thank you. All right, Karen Braby, followed by Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate this discussion. Um, I just wanted to raise kind of a, a slightly different angle. Um, of course, we want to welcome the public into the council chamber and into the advisory body meetings uh, when the time is right. I, I feel pretty strongly that if we are not welcoming uh, our advisory bodies fully in person that we should have the same process for the public uh, in April as we did in March. And, um, and it's really in my mind uh, about access to each other and access to council members. And um, I almost see that as being kind of an inequity for our advisory body members. If we say, sure, the public can come, but the advisory bodies need to stay virtual. And so I think um, kind of forcing a, a square peg into a round hole for April doesn't make sense to me. And we should continue what we've done uh, for the March meeting in April and plan on full celebratory reopening uh, as health conditions allow in June. Um, so a slightly different perspective, different reasons, but um, uh, I, I think that that equal access or equal invitation piece of it is important. And I want our advisory bodies uh, to come in person and that that isn't going to be possible for April. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Joe Oatman. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I too uh, support you know, having the April meeting similar to uh, what we 
the better place for this meeting. Um, I, I do want to speak to um, the expected uh, tribal uh, co-manager participation um, uh, that relates to the same issues in uh, North of Falcon. Um, so we did have, as I've noted previously, um, some uh, tribal officials um, there on site um, at our meeting. Um, and I expect for April um, that we'll be uh, getting uh, even more uh, travel uh, participants there um, in Seattle, given you know the, the location and uh, given the, the same agenda items that we have. Um, and so I do appreciate um, you know having uh, their uh, involvement and participation. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, make a, a note, and I'm not too sure how we uh, may be able to deal with this. Um, but you know, th there are some you know limited seats there within the uh, council room. Um, not too sure you know, how many chairs there. Um, uh, something like less than 20, maybe. Um, and one of the tribal representatives let me know that uh, you know. He had wanted to attend uh, and listen to the council session on salmon. Um, we were picking up the uh, alternative management measures um, and it wasn't able to find a seat. So I just wanted to um, inform the council um, you know, that there is some interest in uh, on the travel part to uh, listen to some of the council discussion, you know, to the extent you know, um, the seating allows. Um, but you know, there's that challenge. Uh, of actually finding a seat available. Um, I just wanted to uh, pass that along to you for um, some consideration. Thank you. Hey, Joe, I apologize. I didn't quite hear your, your opening comments and your public comment. I, could, you, could you try that again and try to speak up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear me uh, better? Yes, this is better. Okay, thank you. So um, my, my opening comment was uh, I, I support you know, having the April uh, format, you know, be, you know, similar to what, you know, we've had at this meeting in terms of, um, you know, who, uh, you know, can attend the meeting. Um, and so I didn't, didn't expect, you know, much change there, I suppose, relative to what we are planning for at the April meeting. Um, but, and I did want to uh, make note that, um, you know, we did have tribal, uh, officials um, uh, there on site uh, at the March meeting, this meeting. Uh, and I expect that we'll have even more folks uh, be there uh, at the April, April meeting in Seattle, you know, given the, the location and the salmon uh, agenda items that we'll be dealing with. Um, and so I do expect um, you know, uh, more individuals from the tribes there. Um, you know, I appreciate you know their uh, ability to attend, you know, as, as co-managers, um, as well as dealing with North of Falcon. And I did want to know, um, the last comment was, you know, there is limited seating there in the council uh, chambers. Um, you know, I wanted to pass along a concern that, uh, you know, some uh, tribal folks wanted to uh, listen to some of the council discussion um, when that was up on salmon and wasn't able to find a seat. And so I don't know how we deal with that, but, but that is a concern. Hope that came through okay. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, Marcy Remco, followed by Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanna really thank Karen for her um, well, uh, reasoned remarks just a second ago and and maybe put another point of emphasis uh, out there for consideration. Um, you know, I, I think we all completely agree we would rather have everybody here with us together in person, all our advisors um, and fully open doors to the public. Um, but what I see uh, with a situation where we might open the doors to the public and yet not our advisory bodies, 
um, creates a, a challenging situation with access to the council. Um, members of the public who come to testify to us um, often are looking to have sidebar discussions and uh, glean insight um, from council members. And almost always, uh, those members of the public, really their first line of communication should be with the advisory body that handles the content that they're interested in discussing. So I have some, I guess, reservation about the idea of allowing doors fully open to the public and yet not having our advisors there to, to help us um, assist in these communications with members of the public that may uh, show up and, and want to testify or have questions about a particular subject matter. Um, I very much appreciate and value the role that our ABs uh, perform for the council in um, helping with the communications and um, leading um, maybe newer members of the public by the hand to help them understand why a proposal uh, exists and uh, exactly what the council process is for considering it. Um, so I just can't reiterate enough how critical it is. I think that um, that they be the first on the priority list when it comes to um, considering who we have here with us at a meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy Butch. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm coming to from a different venue. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're loud and clear, Butch. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Sorry. And a semi-public place, too. So if you hear a little extra noise, uh, that's why. Um, I, I am planning to attend in April, but I, I, I do have to support um, Karn and Bra Brady's statement. I, I do agree with that. And and Marcy, um, you know, the main goal in life is to get back to full swing. But I, but I also... I want to take the time to think about council staff and what they've got to do between now and in April and, and, and what they've done. I, I, I think, you know, we got to recognize that we're, you know, stretching them pretty, pretty thin. And I think that um, the, the way I read it, the, the April meeting was going to be kind of a mirror image of the March meeting. And, and that's acceptable to me. I, I think that, uh, you know, if, if we want to start planning, you know, to uh, do something different then June is probably the June or September is probably the more realistic time frame. So to help council staff, um, you know, I, I think there's going to have to be some improvements done, you know, to the SAS room and the SDT room. That'll take some time and thinking uh, between now and March. Um, and 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 so I, I think the plate is full. I think we've kind of made our plan already. I think we need to stick to it um, and go go with what we've kind of put out there already. And and uh, and then hope June or September will every everybody be in the same same room together. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for taking my comments. Certainly, Bush. It's good to hear you. Um, I, I do think you touched on a point. I think the members of the public did not find. Um, the hybrid functioning of the SAS to be satisfactory. And I think that's why at least some members of the public want to attend the SAS in person. So I think that it's either going to be one or the other, where they're going to have to make that a more meaningful um, process for public participation in the SAS. And those of us who have worked on SAM and know how important that process is or allow them to attend <clears throat> at least the SAS. Um, I appreciate the comments that, you know, having some here and not all is, is not a perfect solution, but we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. And so um, I, I wanna make sure that if we're gonna deny the public access to the council meeting that all members of the public have an adequate substitute. Um, those that are already participating in 
virtual meetings have that substitute. But the salmon folks at the moment don't. So I just think we need to address that issue. Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I think my in in listening to all of this, my what I've at least in my own mind, my my uh, conclusion is that we should handle the April meeting in the same manner in which we did this meeting. Notwithstanding, I know that the um, council staff and is aware of the issues within the SAS for people that were trying to tune into that. And I am confident that, that they will find a solution to, to that. But um, so notwithstanding that, I, I, I think where we are and for a lot of the reasons that others have, have spoken to that we should, we should endeavor to, to conduct our April meeting in this room in the same manner in which we have um, at this meeting. Um, on the tribal piece, uh, you know, there are, we, we have a, a large number of, of folks that are participate in the North Falcon process, as many of you know. And the, the, the final North Falcon meetings are held in conjunction with the April Council meeting, something else you already know. Um, and I am I am confident uh, that if we reached out to the tribes and let them know uh, what we were, how our our meeting room is structured, and that if we requested them to limit their their attendance in the council room to their to the people that really need to be here, that they would respond in a positive way if we reached out to them. So I think there's a way to accommodate the uh, tribal policy people that would like to be in the room when we're having our discussions about the ocean salmon fisheries. And it, but at the same time, not thinking that we're gonna have an additional 30, 40, 50 people in here. Um, but uh, so that's what I'm recommending that we do to to keep our our room as small in terms of attendance as we can, um, yet respecting um, the tribal the tribal governments who have direct um, in, um, um, Direct connections to to the actions taken by this by this council relative to to the fisheries. So um, that's that's kind of where I've ended up in my mind. Thanks, Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for this uh, really good discussion. Maybe, maybe just some additional information as I I feel like we might be starting to coalesce around an approach here. Um, so one of the things that weighs heavily on me and I, I know it weighs heavily on you all is um, you know, just the public process nature of, of what we do. And, um, you know, it, it is it's quite unfortunate that um, the, the tools that we had and that we had tested and we thought we we're going to work here did not did not work that well. And so as as my staff and I take a step back and, and um, think about how we could do that more effectively, you know, one option is to allow the public to participate in person in the SAS and to communicate and convey their, their, um, their thoughts and, and what have you. There, there are other ways, other things we could explore. Um, and, um, you know, just uh, in communicating with, um, you know, Chris, for instance, we have, it could be possible to bring in um, a dedicated AV person into the SAS room and run it kind of like a mini council meeting. And um, so that there would be mics and there would be somebody um, um, running that. I think that's what we would, what we would uh, pursue if you uh, want to um, not have the 
the public be in person for the salmon process. That would come at a several thousand dollar expense. Um, and I know we've discussed, uh, you know, budget situations earlier this week, and there was some current concern about that. I, I personally would not be that concerned because I think that cost would be offset by, um, you know, just having the smaller meeting again in April, like, like we're having here. So I, I think that that would be manageable. Um, so I just, I guess I would just put that out there that that would be the kind of setup that we'd be looking at um, in the SAS to help facilitate um, a, a public uh, participation remotely, even while the SAS is in person. So just some added information there as I'm thinking about this and listening to your discussion. All right, I think uh, Merrick, you adequately summarized the sense of the council in terms of public participation. I think we can leave the technical, uh, addressing the technical matters in the SAS uh, to staff uh, to deal with. Um, and just keeping in mind that the SAS often breaks down into separate groups. Um, but I think that, um, you know, just giving them a ring central line is probably all they need for that. So that should not be um, the, the least bit difficult. So um, if we've resolved that issue of the public at the council meeting, we still have the issues of testing and masks. So I'd like to get the sense of the council there. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, perhaps before we leave the last uh, topic, I, I think we need to talk a little bit about what our goals are for the future. I've heard people talk about the potential of maybe having some of the virtual meetings or a portion of our annual, our, our annual schedule be virtual. There's been talk of that. We've never formally discussed it, but it seems to me that if we're going to invest in, and I have no problem with the technology for a short-term meeting, but if, if there's gonna be a, a longer term uh, desire to maybe not meet in person every five times a year, that we may wanna think of this differently in our investment in this technology to accommodate our uh, advisory panels and such. And I know there, you know, potentially some, we've had discussions about budget and things like that, but it would be nice to sometimes set aside sometime, maybe not today, maybe today, to just express what we're thinking in our long-term planning to address the, the efficiencies that could be had for doing that and maybe some of the budget efficiencies given the reports we had on that. So I'll stop there, but I just that's just something that was in mind, so thank you. All right, thanks for that, Bob. I, I would like to hold off on longer-term discussions until after we have settled on our procedure for our April meeting. And so we can come back to that. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. You asked about testing and masks and I was uh, wanted to say that I really appreciate the council's uh, facilitation of um, the, the testing for council members and others there in person at this meeting. Uh, it really gave me uh, much more confidence being there with everybody. And so if if that, I, I guess I, I would encourage exploration of, of whether that's a continued option for, for April. I understand there are probably some logistics, et cetera, considerations there, but uh, I, I appreciate it, thought it um, was very helpful. And I would feel even more strongly that way if we uh, are are going to, uh, depending on, I guess, the, the outcome of the discussion on masks, which I have no comment on at this time. All right, thank you, Maggie. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. And um, on that, that subject too, I also appreciated um, the testing and providing the test kits for us. I, I had a lot of comfort when we were in this room that it was fine and I was just gonna link that a little to the discussion that we'll have about masking and um, just that perhaps if we are, if the council discussion and we end up continuing the testing, 
or or some form of it, maybe for folks that are symptomatic, something like that, that if if we are testing that when we're in the council room, we might be able to take our masks off. I um, just a thought. Thanks. I know for myself, it's a lot easier to hear people and to conduct our business without the masks. But I um, let's see if there's any further comment on that. Uh, Phil Anderson. <laughs> Yeah, I generally I support Heather's the thought there. I, I've, I've found myself, um, you know, this is probably the safest room there is to be in right, right here. And it was ironic that I found myself, I went out of this room and then took my mask off so that I could breathe. When if there was a place that I should have felt the most comfortable without a mask, it was in here. So I don't, I'm, I too, I just, it's a lot easier to hear people under, um, without the mask. I, I I'm, I, I am happy to do it either way. I would, I think if we relaxed our mask rule in our room, in, in this room that I'd be comfortable with that. Well, let me see if there's any strong objection to adopting, at least in this room for April, a mask optional policy. Not to say, you know, people should be comfortable. And if you're more comfortable wearing a mask, that's perfect. So I'm not seeing any hands. So I'm assuming that that we in the room, at least while we're in this room under the, under the procedure we've adopted for attendance in this room, that that will be okay for April. And obviously, uh, in June, we may have another discussion. Uh, Dr. Braby. Yeah, I would just note that um, people who are uncomfortable uh, not having masks on may not be comfortable saying so today. And so I would just encourage uh, anybody who is concerned about that to talk to the executive director and council staff after the meeting and not finalize that until that's confirmed. I'm comfortable with either way. I think that's fair. So please reach out to Merrick Burden. And Merrick Burden. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman um, and everyone. Um, so some of the comments before the this uh, masking um, guidance or option made me think that perhaps that was conditioned on there continuing to be a testing requirement of some kind. Is that the, the will of the council? And if so, I, I guess I would uh, point out that we are a couple of weeks away and Patricia and I have been communicating about uh, whether we could secure enough tests for daily testing. We, we do still have some on hand that might lend itself to, you know, every two or three days or something. Um, and if that's sufficient, I think we're probably okay. Um, it's the daily testing requirement. I, I, I'm not totally certain on that we would have the supplies on hand to do so. If you're okay with two or three days, I think we should be fine. So. All right. And, and certainly if, if you feel more comfortable communicating any reservations privately, uh, please address them uh, to Mr. Burden. Phil Anderson. Yeah, I just I just want to make for, for me I'm I want to honor I want to go to the lowest whatever the lowest common denominator is that makes this group feel comfortable. If there's only one or two people that want masks, that's fine with me. I'll wear a mask. I you know, even if it's one, I I I'm just I will I will do whatever uh, meets so that everybody that's in the room is comfortable. So. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, I completely agree, completely agree. And um, when I made my comment earlier and, and Merrick, you picked up on this, the idea of not masking was linked to the idea that we were testing. And I realized that testing every day was not a requirement of us. Um, so we also, you know, that's our 
at our discretion, I assume it was just a recommendation. And so also know that that maybe not everyone is testing. And so that comfort is is um, is what it is. So I also agree that um, I'm willing to keep wearing a mask and and testing as we have been doing. But yeah, and I agree. We, people need to be comfortable here. But uh, I would also say if the daily testing would make a difference to someone they and, and they communicate that to Mr. Burden, that that would be helpful as well, because, um, you know, there's always Amazon for tests. Uh, Butch Smith. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I just, you know, I, I'm I'm in the camp of Phil and Heather, what, what, whatever it takes. And if somebody feels more comfortable, we have to wear a mask, then we have to have, wear a mask. But I just like to remind the council also is uh, that we'll be kind of in the midst or just at the tail end of spring break. So um, if, if, you know, if we're going to see a bump up, we'll certainly see it, you know, probably the week before the council meeting. And so that'll be available. And I uh, don't, 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 I hope we don't see a bump up, but, but if there was, I think that's, that's a reminder. And, and Washington has probably like other other state has a, a really good uh, heat map of, of where the, uh, where the outbreaks are and what counties are kind of going through more than others by a green, yellow, uh, red system. And and so anyway, those are some tools that I'm sure America has at his fingertips and, and that we can use, but certainly what it takes to, to do this and, and keep people safe is, is I, I, I'm all for it. And it, it is a hassle to wear a mask, but, but the alternative is, is, uh, is not good. So anyway, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thanks, Butch. I want to, um, I've got received some messages, folks wanting a bio break, and um, I'd like to honor those. <laughs> but I also don't want I also don't want to break before we finish our April discussion. Um, so uh, I, I think I know where we are. Uh, Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, agree with council members I've heard so far talk about this and thank Phil um, and Heather for their thoughts. I am completely in agreement with that. If, if one person's uncomfortable, then I want to be, I want to recognize that and honor that. Um, I also wanted to, you know, I think that our primary goal is keeping everybody safe and keeping everybody healthy. And so that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Um, and then uh, maybe this is obvious, but I just wanted to clarify that this is all contingent on uh, local and federal guidelines about masking meetings and such. Um, thanks. Of course, we follow the most conservative guidance. So yes, uh, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. I totally appreciate and I, I respect all the uh, opinions around the table here and, and that we've heard. I think um, pe people being comfortable with it is, is important. But, you know, having sat here all week, eight hours or more a day with a mask on, I'm struggling myself personally with that. I think the opposite is true too. And I think if, if, uh, Someone decides if there's a mask mandate, and they and and they really object to that, or they don't want to subject themselves to that. We have the opposite. We can we can participate remotely and stay home, and I don't think that's a problem myself. So, I think we got to respect both sides of it as far as comfort and as far as being uh, being able to participate in this process. That's just my opinion. And um, so, but I do respect everyone else's opinion too. And I think it's important that it's a changing format to be a completely different uh, landscape when we do go to Seattle. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, by the way. It's good to see everybody this week. But I, um, I, I just wanted to express that, that this hasn't been an easy week for me personally sitting here and I do Acknowledge Phil had it spot on that I think around this table inside the, the 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 tape that's at the end of the table that pretty much isolates us. This is the safest spot in the entire city as far as I could tell. <laughs> and so uh, to that end, I think sitting at this table 
without a mask is perfectly acceptable to me, given today's conditions. That could change. And I think flexibility is the key here. So thank you. All right. Thanks for that. Um, I'd like to wrap our discussion on April here. And I'd ask Mr. Bird, you can just quickly summarize where we are. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and thank you all for uh, for this uh, very good discussion. And I'm I'm very pleased to hear many of you express uh, how safe you feel like this meeting has been. That that was one of our goals. Um, so I have a couple of notes here to myself. So one is um, we um, will plan to conduct the April meeting like we have this March meeting. We will uh, make some pains internally to try to figure out how to improve the SAS process and already. Um, Chris and I were texting back and forth about some options, so um, I think we will be able to make an improvement. Um, in terms of public attendance, we will continue to uh, discourage that. Um, let's see, in terms of uh, tribal attendance, we will reach out to the tribes and communicate to them uh, our plan and um, with the, I guess, the implication that we would hope that the 70 or so folks that they have brought in the past could be scaled down. Um, we will try to accommodate um, a seating arrangement for those that do attend to be able to uh, listen to their council deliberations. In terms of, um, let's see here, in terms of COVID risks, um, so um, what you all have discussed is that masking would be optional. Um, however, it's noted that folks might not be comfortable expressing their discomfort with that. If, uh, if anyone here is in that camp, please reach out to me. Um, I will hold that in confidence, um, your, your name, um, but please do so as soon as you can so that we can uh, uh, plan and proceed um, appropriately. Um, in terms of testing, um, I will uh, work with Patricia to try to secure as many tests as we can. Um, and I think we are already in a decent place. We should be able to uh, have tests um, for you all for at least every few days. I'm not sure exactly how many. Uh, we'll try to scale up from there to the degree that we can and have those available for you uh, in April. I think that's it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me know if I've missed anything. All right. Can All right, Phil? have one slight modification or change to what you said. I, I was not suggesting that we ask the tribes to bring fewer people to the North Falcon process, which is the 70 or whatever it is. I was suggesting that we reach out to them and let them know what we're trying to do in terms of keeping our council room safe and that if they could work and limit the number of, 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 of policy representatives that need to be in this room that we would appreciate that and if they could communicate, you know, some, and we can do that when we get to the April council meeting, but it wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that we ask them to reduce the number of tribal folks that come to the meeting. All right, thanks for that clarification, Phil. All right, I think we've got April done. We still have ear at a glance and our salmon agenda items. Uh, and any other discussion folks feel or must have on day last, but we also need to check out of our rooms by 11 o'clock. So uh, we are going to take our morning break here and plan to be back at, uh, we'll take a 30 minute break and plan to be back at 1055. We'll then pick up with the year at a glance and then hopefully our salmon will be ready uh, when we're done with that. So we'll see you back here in half an hour.
All right, we're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. Um, we're going to take a break from C7 and uh, take care of our salmon matters. And then we'll come back to C7 year at a glance. So just give us a couple of minutes to get the salmon folks here. While we're waiting for our salmon folks to arrive, I'm going to pass the gavel to our vice chair for salmon. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik, and uh, we'll stand by here until everybody's in place.
Okay, we're uh, back in session here, and I'm uh, looking to uh, Robin to start us off on uh, D7. Robin? Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D7, where we will adopt the 2022 management alternatives for public review. We have the STT report where they've ran the analysis. That's agenda item D7A. And we'll have comments from the tribes, agencies, advisory body, and public before adopting these proposed ocean salmon fishery management alternatives. The alternatives should meet fishery management plan objectives, spawner objective goals, allocation, annual catch limits, et cetera. Any need for implementation by emergency rule must be clearly noted and consistent with the council's and NIMS emergency criteria, which we provided under agenda item D3, attachment two and three. So the council action under this agenda item is to adopt the 2022 ocean salmon fishery management alternatives for public review and identify and justify any alternatives that require implementation for emergency rule, which I don't think is the case this year, happy to say. For your reference materials, we do have a report from NIMS. Um, they're going to provide further guidance. We also have two reports from the STT. And I believe we'll have public, well, we'll have tribal comment and then any public comment as well. So that concludes my summary. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, questions for Robin on her, uh, her summary? Okay, with that, we'll go to the NIPS report and uh, Susan Bishop. Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, members of the council. I'll be speaking to agenda item D7A, supplemental NIMS report one, revised 2022 NIMS guidance for the California Coastal Chinook Salmon Evolutionary uh, Significant Unit. At the March meeting, NIMS guidance letter included an alternative to its default guidance for California Coastal Chinook that was intended to allow for consideration of additional information provided by the council and or its advisory bodies, which NIMS might consider in further refinement of that guidance. At this time, I would like to provide some additional thoughts and refinements to our guidance based on additional information available since the guidance letter was finalized and provided to the council. Our refined guidance taking into account the information summarized below was provided verbally to the council on March 12th, 2022 under agenda item D4. The NIMS guidance for the California Coastal Chinook Salmon ESU was to manage ocean salmon fisheries more conservative, conservatively in 2022, so as not to exceed the 16% age four ocean harvest rate on Klamath River Fall Chinook, given the pattern of performance in recent years. And some of the additional background is provided in the guidance letter itself, which is under agenda item D3B. Um, I won't read the specific guidance here. We've discussed that before. Um, recall that in 2021, we collectively expressed concern regarding the pattern of exceeding the KRFC age four harvest rate on ocean fisheries. The council at that time made substantial changes to the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model, KOHM model, in hopes that the changes would correct the observed bias. Although the changes to the model showed improvement, the 2021 um, observed ocean rate unfortunately substantially exceeded the limit. The consistent magnitude of the overage across recent years and concerns about the implication to management of uh, Klamath River Falls Chinook harvest and spawning escapement, as well as protection of the ESA listed California coastal Chinook salmon provided the basis of our default guidance of a 40% buffer on the pre-season anticipated age four KRFC harvest rate as described in the guidance letter. Just sort of Adding a little bit to that, as described in the letter, this buffer was not intended to apply to the 16% limit itself, but rather to the age four rate projected by the model, given a fishing package that meets other constraints that drove fishery shaping. So I just add that little bit because it's been a point of confusion and I got a couple of questions since the uh, revised guidance was provided. However, we recognize that there may be further actions that might be identified that might fi better find a balance of to both the fishery and the resource while meeting the ESA guidance. That was the intent behind the alternative pathway offered in our guidance. In considering an alternative relative to the default guidance, NIMS must determine, however, whether the alternative would provide the same level of certainty that the 2022 ocean fisheries uh, would not exceed the 16% age four ocean harvest rate on Klamath River Falchinook. 
the range of age four Klamath River Fall Chinook harvest rates considered by the council this week have ranged from about 11% to just over 14%. The 40% buffer applied to that range would result in an age four Klamath River Fall Chinook harvest rate target of seven to 8.5%. And similarly, just adding in 7% for the final preseason rates from the recent 2018 to 2021 average years. However, in refining the guidance, NIMS considered the most recent revisions to the KOHM, the information presented in pre-1, analyzing the effects of the model revisions, environmental conditions that may have contributed to the high contact rates information, and discussions with the Salmon Advisory Subpanel and Oregon and California state managers. So I sort of go through a, a bullet list of, you know, where we came out on those things. Unusually high contact rates relative to effort in the fishery appear to be one of the primary drivers in the higher age for KRFC rates in recent years. Contact rates experienced in 2021 were higher than those anticipated when revisions were made to the model for 2021 preseason planning. The revisions to the KOHM use contact rates in the use contact rates in the most recent years, 2015 to 2019. Contact rates in those years are the highest in the data series for most areas and are higher in most areas and months when compared to the contact rates used in 2021 modeling. And uh, I, I refer to you fig to figures one and two that are at the end of the document to see that, uh, that information um, in graphic form. The information in figure one indicates that the contact rates in the California KMZ, KMZ Fort Bragg and Monterey management areas continue, or San Francisco, that should be San Francisco management areas, continue to trend upwards, introducing uncertainty as to whether the rates for 2022 could exceed those, in fact, in the data series. So something we don't, we don't know for sure whether something like what happened last year might not occur this year, which is we assumed the rates would be similar and in fact they were exceeded. So if you look at the figure one, you will see that those contact rates in those areas just continue to climb. There doesn't appear to be um, a tipping point uh, for several of the months. In the analysis of the KOHM revisions as summarized in Appendix D of the pre-1 report, it indicates that the revisions made in 2022 do substantially reduce the likelihood of exceeding the age four KRFC ocean salmon limit when compared to the data used in the 2021 KOHM revision and the performance summarized in NIMS's guidance letter. However, the retrospective analysis indicates that the updated model will st would still have underpredicted the KRFC ocean four ocean, the KRFC age four ocean exploitation rate limit in three of the four years in the analysis, by an average of 18 percent, and the and the difficulty is that that was substantially the case in 2021, um, where we just uh, the overprediction was about um, 40 to 50 percent. Um, the 2021 result may be an anomaly or it may represent a further shift in the behavior of the fishery. Adjusting for the 18% over prediction results in an age four KRFC harvest rate target of nine to 11.5%. Also uh, worth noting is that additionally exploratory model runs using this year's alternatives and aiming for the year's main constraint absent an age four buffer. So if you were just looking at what it would take to achieve the Klamath uh, spawning escapements, suggested an attainment um, at an age four rate of about 11.7%. Applying an 18% postseason buffer to that number results in 9.6%. In addition, um, as for example, we heard yesterday in the um, IEA report, uh, environmental indicators have also been an important driver in the pattern of, of contact rates in recent years. Ocean conditions have likely led to the high survival and concentration of anchovies and other preferred prey off of Fort Bragg and San Francisco management areas in recent years. Salmon have followed the food, concentrating in those areas as well, and the fishermen have followed the salmon. Low flows and high temperatures in the Sacramento and Klamath rivers may have led to thermal blockages, impeding migration into the rivers, and low freshwater survival of the spawners once they made it there. As resource stewards, we know the importance of looking ahead, considering this year in the context of what we might expect in the near future. The integrated ecosystem assessment presented at the March meeting indicates the conditions observed in 2021 are likely to continue in 2022. 
And finally, discussions with the SAS and CDFW staff, along with the documentation describing proposed fishing, recommend, fishing regimes under consideration by the council, indicate that ocean salmon seasons in 2022 will be much more constrained in 2022 when compared with 2021 for the areas and months with greatest impacts to KRFC Chinook. State managers, state fishery managers are proposing to reduce the number of days open in the San Francisco management area for salmon fishing by about 60% in June and 35% in August. Um, and as speaking to Fort Bragg, the seasons under consideration range from a full closure to a reduction of 41% of the days of high contact in August. So I know that those, you know, we'll hear more in our guidance and some of those things were still in play since I wrote this, but that gives that gives folks an, a sort of a, a perspective of the magnitude of the changes that we're talking about this year relative to 2020, 20, 2021 on which we based our guidance. So taking all this information into account, uh, the inv of information available at this time, including the revisions to the model and the practical realities of the fishing seasons under consideration, indicate the risk of an overprediction of the age for KRS ocean harvest rate is reduced compared to the NEMS default analysis. However, there are significant uncertainties as described above and taking a cautious approach to the 2022 season in setting the guidance for California Coastal Chinook is a prudent approach. Therefore, NEMS's re revised guidance is that managing for a target age for KRFC ocean exploitation rate of 10% would best balance the needs and interests of the fisheries with the needs and the interests of the fish, given the uncertainties identified in our in the in the supplemental report, I do want to say that I greatly appreciate the, all the work of the STT and the SAS on the issues, the creative problem solving, um, lots of rocks overturned, the open conversations, and the time spent with me to better understand the fisheries and the implication of NIMS's guidance to those fisheries. Um, I know folks were busy, and the SAS in particular took a substantial amount of time. Uh, to sit down and talk with me. And that concludes uh, my uh, NIMS report. Okay, thank you, Susan. Uh, questions for Susan on the NIMS report? Okay, very good. That'll take us to the ST STT report and um, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I will be referring to agenda item D7A, supplemental STT report one, our analysis of uh, pre preliminary management alternatives. Um, I think we can just cut to the chase and turn towards the back of your packet to table five. On the first page of table five, uh, we'll note that um, for alternatives one and two, uh, Thule Chinook uh, exploitation rate exceeds its uh, its uh, maximum allowable currently. And <clears throat> moving down to Klamath River Fall, under alternative two, uh, the Klamath River Fall Chinook H4 ocean harvest rate of 10.5% exceeds NIMS guidance of uh, less than or equal to 10%. I'll also note for Klamath River Fall Chinook that the escapement levels reported for each of the three alternatives are identical and they are equal to the minimum level for this year which is 38,180 fish. The reason for that is <clears throat> at the end of our uh, March and April meetings any further surplus surplus fish uh, available um, are transferred to the river recreational fishery allocation in order for the tribes to get their full uh, 50% of the allowable surplus. Moving on to the next page in Coho, and um, there are no Coho stocks that uh, are uh, outside their uh, objectives for this, um, for the three alternatives. So that concludes my um, overview of, um, of the results of the STT uh, analysis, and I can try to answer any questions. Okay. Questions for uh, Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report? Very good. Thank you. Okay. Next, I'll go to the um,
trouble report and uh, Joe Oatman. Joe, are you there? Okay. Actually, it's, yeah, it's out there. It's um, you know, with uh, Eric Holt. Um, Eric, are you there? Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, Robin. Sorry to interrupt. Um, the STT does have two reports. I don't know if you want to go to the second report. And um, for the tribal uh, people that are testifying, we have those uh, ready to go and I can give you their names. My bad. Mike, could you come up and take care of that, the men of the statement? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll be referring to agenda item D7A, Supplemental STT Report 2, STT Report on the 2022 Klamath River Falls Chinook de minimis exploitation rate. For 2022, the Klamath River Falls Chinook Harvest Control Rule specifies a de minimis maximum allowable exploitation rate of 25%. The Salmon FMP requires consideration of several factors when recommending de minimis, de minimis exploitation rates. From the FMP, it states, when recommending an allowable de minimis, de minimis exploitation rate in a given year, the council shall also consider the following circumstances. Potential for critically low spawner abundance, including consideration for substocks that may fall below cr crucial genetic thresholds, spawner abundance levels in recent years, the status of commingled stocks, indicators of marine and freshwater environmental conditions, minimal needs for tribal fisheries, whether the, stock, whether the stock is currently in an approaching an overfished condition, whether the stock is currently overfished and other considerations as appropriate. So the team assessed, uh, give a preliminary assessment of these circumstances with the exception of minimal needs for tribal fisheries. And I'll uh, go through our, um, our findings of that preliminary assessment. First, the potential for low spawner abundance. Potential for critically low spawner abundance could be considered moderate. The 2022 minimum natural area spawner escapement of 38,180 adults is greater than the minimum stock size threshold. A natural area escapement of 38,180 adults would represent the 25th lowest value over the past 44 years. Substocks. To assess the potential for critically low abundance of substocks, a statistical model was applied to historical run size data to assess the prob probability that escapement to either the Salmon, Scott, or Shasta rivers would fall below two, 720 adults, given a total basin-wide natural area escapement of 38,180 in 2022. The 720 adult escapement threshold for these substocks was based on effective population size considerations. Application of the model suggested that at least one of the substocks would fall below the 720 adult threshold with a probability of 14%. Recent spawner abundance. The natural area adult spawner escapement has been lower than the MSST in six of the last 10 years and four of the last five years. The 2022 forecast of natural area spawners in the absence of fishing is 50,906 adults, which is above the maximum sustainable yield spawner escapement of 40,700. If fishing seasons are structured such that the maximum allowable exploitation rate of 25% is met, the natural area adult spawner expectation is 38,180, which is larger than the MST but below SMSY. Commingled stocks. With regard to commingled stocks, Sacramento River Falls Chinook have a moderate abundance forecast and are likely to be less constraining to fisheries than Klamath River Falls Chinook in 2022. Environmental indicators. Indicators of marine and freshwater conditions provided in the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment, California Current Ecosystem Report for 2022 suggest a mixed assessment of marine and freshwater conditions that could affect Klamath River Falls Chinook. Table J.2.3 in the CCIEA report displays stoplight indicators, including adult abundance, incubation, freshwater residence, hatchery releases, and marine indicators relevant to KRFC abundance. 
the number of adult spawners in years 2018 and 2019, which would represent the parental spawners for age four and age three in 2022, were moderately and low respectively. Brood year 2018 progeny experienced mostly average conditions during incubation and freshwater residence, while brood year 2019 progeny encountered a mixture of conditions in freshwater, but generally poor freshwater residence conditions. Ocean indicators suggested poor conditions for brood year 2018 and mixed conditions for brood year 2019. Overall, the stoplight indicators suggest that the Klamath River falsion of broods that will make up the bulk of the adult abundance in 2022 experience mixed conditions in marine and freshwater habitats. Approaching an overfish condition, uh, the Klamath River Fall Chinook stock currently meets the criteria for being at risk of approaching an overcondition. However, in the next line, overfish status, Klamath River Fall Chinook was declared overfished following the 2017 escapement year and continues to meet the criteria for overfish status in 2022. And that concludes our statement. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Questions uh, for the SD, uh, SDT on the uh, report, too? I think, I think now you're good. <laughs> okay, next we'll the tribal report. And Joe Oatman. If, if, if Joe's not there, then we'll go uh, directly to James Marsh. James? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Good day, members of the council. My name is James Marsh. I'm a member of the Umatilla Fish and Wildlife Committee, a crit fit commissioner and a treaty fisher on the Columbia River. I've been asked to present this statement on behalf of the four Columbia River tribes with federally recognized treaty fishing rights. The Yakima Nation, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederate Tribes of Warren Springs Reservation of Oregon, and the Nez Perce Tribe. Our tribes have had to continue to have a vital cultural, social, and economic needs for salmon. Salmon are critical as part of our first foods. As the council develops its options for 2022 ocean salmon fisheries, we would like to remind it of the enormous work the tribes do to support salmon recovery efforts. We do not support salmon recovery just that fisheries can increase. We support salmon recovery as a key to maintaining our culture and way of life, preserving traditional ecological knowledge and supporting functioning ecosystems. There has been an enormous reduction in habitat accessible to salmon in the Columbia Basin. Roughly 45% of historic, historic habitat is still accessible to salmon, and a large majority of that habitat is within the tribe's seeded areas. Therefore, the tribes co-manage much of the recovery effort in, within the basin. Tribes have often led the way to utilization of hatcheries as salmon recovery tool. Both reintroduction and supplementation are important uses for hatcheries. The tribes have been leaders in helping develop the understanding of how hatcheries can be used as a recovery tool while minimizing any potential risk to natural origin fish. Our most successful supplementation program is, is with the Snake River Fall Chinook. It took a great deal of work to begin this program in the 1990s because the states and the federal governments were initially very reluctant. Fortunately, this program has evolved into a successful jointly run program between several parties. It has resulted in stable returns of natural origin fall Chinook with an average return to the lower Grand Dam in the past five years of almost 7,000 adult fish. Another key program has been our effort to reinduce coho. Coho 
were exportated in Emotella in the Snake Basin in almost all the upper Columbia. The tribes have developed several programs to restore coho in these areas. These programs have continued to expand in recent re reintroductions of coho into the Grand Round. Each of these programs have been normally been producing good returns. In last year, returns were outstanding. In 2021, the coho counts at each dam upstream Bonneville were record high, were record high adult counts. The whole the coho count at Lower Granite was over 24,000, and at Priest Rapids was almost 48,000. We believe these programs would not exist without tribal efforts. Without hat without hatcheries. There would be many areas of the Columbia Basin that would simply not have certain species of salmon. We also note that while the U.S. First Oregon parties have started programs that increase hatchery production to assist in prey availability for orcas, we urge that there be more focus on addressing our factors, other factors affecting orcas, such as water quality and shipping noise. While we readily take on important roles of recovery efforts, we do not think we should have be burdened with these roles since it's not our, our actions that drove these salmon populations down. We look, we look for continued collaboration on many of these programs, utilizing hatcheries for recovery. But we also remind people that the West Coast hatcheries, especially those in the Columbia River are aging in need of expensive upgrades and repair. Additionally, many hatchery water supplies are being adversely affected by climate change. It will be critical work, work together to find the resources to resolve these issues to give salmon and the fisheries that depend on them a chance. Regarding the ocean options under consideration, we are continuing to review projected impacts to Columbia River stocks. The harvest restrictions in place due to ESA listings restrict the ability of the tribes to harvest 50% of the harvestable number of fall Chinook and coho. But we continue to caution in ocean fishery planning to ensure enough fish return to meet tribal fishery needs, as well as escaping through fish to spawn and support hatchery production. This concludes my statement. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for the, uh, for the report. Uh, I would look to Jim for, uh, for questions for Jim. I would like to say that just I uh, really appreciate you coming for us and, uh, and, uh, and keeping us abreast of uh, what you've done and uh, how important it is to, to the uh, tribal communities. So. Okay, that no, Joe and Joe. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, sorry, I was a little bit slow there in uh, uh, getting here to um, invite uh, James up to uh, provide the uh, Clem River testimony, and I too appreciate. Uh, the information uh, that was contained in that report to uh, describe some of the uh, activities that we are doing to um, benefit fish uh, through uh, the hatchery practices and efforts that, that we are um, doing. I wanted just to make a, a short note that um, it, it did talk about the uh, Snake River Co program. Uh, Nesper's tribe, you know, has been really actively engaged on that. And uh, this past fall, uh, we had an estimated harvest of uh, a little over a thousand fish, uh, which might not seem like a lot, um, but in, in recent years, um, you know, harvest of coho has been uh, something like a hundred fish uh, or less. And so I think the tribe is making some strides uh, in a positive direction to increased adult returns and uh, increased travel fishing on those. So I just wanted to make that note um, to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay. 
I guess we now we go to public comment. Not sure if we have any. Okay, there's no public comment. Now taking us to council action, and I guess I would before we go to the states, I'd just like to open the floor up to see if anybody has any comments before we do that. Okay. Oh. Huh. I, I guess I've been asked here if I, is anybody who wants to, anybody else wants to talk to the tribal report? Nope. Okay. Okay. Mr. Vice Chair. What'd you say? Oh, Robin? Forgive me, I know that some of the uh, Columbia River tribes were also trying to provide testimony. We were having audio issues. Okay. Um, I am not sure if Bruce Jim or Wilbur Slockish are on the line and able to have two-way audio. If they are on the line and can speak up, I suppose we would know. But if not, I think they'll provide their testimony in April, or J Joe could speak better to it. We could pause here for a second and see if do we can. Uh, Joe Oatman, Joe? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I'm aware that, you know, there are some difficulties of uh, Bruce Jim and Wilbur Slockish um, joining uh, this meeting to provide some additional comments. Uh, I think, um, you know, the uh, tribal report that was read into the record by uh, uh, Jim Marsh um, is uh, adequate, and uh, we look forward to some additional um, job reports and comments that are April meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Joe. With that, uh, we'll, we'll um, open the floor for discussion prior to going to the states. If anybody wants to say anything. All right. I guess uh, for. Um, do about the business of adopting the proposed ocean salmon fishery management alternatives for the public review. I'll look to Kyle Attucks in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion for the council. <clears throat> I move to adopt for public review the alternatives for non-Indian commercial and recreational fisheries in the area north of Cape Falcon as presented in agenda item D7A, Supplemental STT Report 1, dated March 14th, 2022. Okay. Kyle, is the language on the screen accurate? Yes. Okay. Phil Anderson? No. No, Phil. Second by Phil Anderson. Check that box. Um, discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Kyle. Look to Oregon and Chris Kern. Chris? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I have a motion. I'm looking for one up. Chris? Okay, thank you. I move to adopt for public review alternatives for ocean commercial and recreational salmon fisheries between Cape Falcon and the Oregon California border as described in agenda item D7A supplemental STT report one dated March 14th, 2022 with the following modifications. In the commercial management alternatives for the area Cape Falcon to Hecata Bank line in alternative two, replace July 20 through 31 with July 22 through 31 
in the area from Hecate Bank Line to Humbug Mountain in alternative two, replace July 20 through 31 with July 22 through 31. And in the area from Humbug Mountain to the Oregon California border, the Oregon KMZ, also in alternative two, replace the June 1 through 30 quota of 800 Chinook with 550 Chinook, replace the July 1 through 31 quota of 500 Chinook with 200 Chinook, and replace June 1 through July 31 weekly landing and possession limit of 50 Chinook per vessel per week, Thursday through Wednesday, with June 1 through July 31 weekly landing and possession limit of 20 Chinook per vessel per week, Thursday through Wednesday. Is the, uh, thank you, Chris. Is the uh, language accurate on the screen? Yes, it is. Second. Krista Swenson. Thank you, Krista. All right. We'll speak to. Sure. Uh, just real quick um, on this one, we are making a couple of last changes. We've worked with the technical team to ensure that this will help us get where we need to be on alternative two in combination with, I think, some other actions we'll hear about shortly. Um, that's it. Okay. Question or discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. And uh, down the coast to uh, California and uh, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Sandra. I move to adopt for STT coalition analysis and public review the salmon management measures for the 2022 commercial and recreational ocean fisheries in the area from the Oregon California border to the US Mexico border as presented in agenda item D7A supplemental STT report one dated March 14th, 2022 with the following modifications. And those are to table one 2022 Troll alternatives on table page 10 of 14. Uh, in the Monterey area from Pigeon Point to the US Mexico border, in alternative two, replace May 1 through 10 with May 1 through 9. And, <clears throat> excuse me, replace May 22 through 31 with May 23 through 31. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you. Very good. Uh, you want to speak to that? Uh, second. Oh, I'm golly. I'm having a hell of a day. Second by Bob Dooley. Okay, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned uh, in the Oregon motion, the uh, proposed uh, modifications, a few, few minor date changes here we are expected to achieve our uh, objectives in alternative two, so that when the table is put out for public review, it will reflect that we have in fact attained uh, all of the uh, required constraints. Um, I'd like to take a moment here uh, to talk about um, the week and the culmination uh, of the contents of these three alternatives uh, from California. Um, this was a tough year and just wanted to um, note that uh, our role uh, in the council is to assure sustainable salmon stocks, and that means all of them. Um, that is the priority uh, with these season alternatives, uh, with the secondary goal of providing for sustainable fisheries. Um, I wanna thank the council for its decision earlier this week to require an elevated sack fall escapement goal. Um, that uh, selection of the, the goal at 180,000 uh, returning adults um, is the highest uh, end of the goal range for sack fall. Uh, this should provide additional assurance that more fish will enter the river this fall um, and will benefit uh, winter run and spring run as well. Um, just want to note that with winter run, um, we'll look to be achieving um, not only under the required 20% uh, 
um, maximum exploitation rate, but in fact, the three alternatives don't have any um, numbers above 15% exploitation. Uh, so that's that's good news. Um, we're certainly concerned about the situation with drought and just want to acknowledge um, the content in the NIMS report that Susan just provided on, on how important it is that we be especially careful uh, this year to ensure that there are enough returning adult, adults to the river. Um, on the Klamath front, things have been tough since 2018 when um, unfortunately they attained overfish status um, and the situation in the Klamath uh, seems to only be getting tougher. For the first time here this week, we've worked through our new Sonk Coho constraints while also meeting new and more restrictive guidance on the constraint for California Coastal Chinook uh, that Ms. Bishop just provided us uh, earlier. Um, just wanting to follow up with some additional thank yous to the SAS, the STT, uh, the council staff and other agency staff for working through what's been an unusually tough March uh, for salmon south of Falcon. Um, there is still uncertainty as, as Susan mentioned, um, but we sure appreciate um, the clarity that NIMS has provided this week on its guidance uh, and the detailed um, reporting and memorializing of that guidance for the records. I really wanna thank the extra effort um, from Susan overnight to pull together a very complete report with um, with the rationale and the, the supporting analysis. Uh, that will allow us um, as we enter our April meeting for there to be very um, um, clear uh, direction with regard to the targets that we'll be modeling to. So that will allow the SAS and the STT to more effectively work uh, toward the final alternative development uh, as we get to April. Um, also want to note um, the hard work of the SAS with regard to the sharing arrangements between California and Oregon fisheries and their careful consideration of the alternatives that best meet the needs of the fishing communities of both of the states, given the available impacts um, that are <laughs> quite constrained this year to share along uh, both states' coasts. Um, we understand that there will be further dialogue uh, between the states on sharing as we develop that alter final alternative in April. And we really want to acknowledge um, the work this week really uh, creates a great foundation that's been laid for the discussions. Um, um, that said, it's, it is a tough outlook, uh, particularly for California commercial. Um, there is very, very little opportunity for our commercial fishery in Northern California. Um, Susan outlined um, in her overview, uh, the severity of the changes and um, they should not be lost on us as we um, continue to develop our alternatives and as we move toward final action and as we consider uh, the situation in the Klamath Basin more holistically uh, in our other council discussions under other agenda items. And um, finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to acknowledge um, our CDFW staff that I know have been there uh, with you all week uh, in the trenches. Um, wanna take a moment to welcome uh, Candace Morgan Stern and Grace Easterbrook to the council family and their uh, hard work learning the ropes in the STT um, and working with um, the SAS, uh, some very long nights, but I really wanna um, send a special thank you to Dr. Pete McHugh of our staff. He's really um, helped me this week, um, serving in a, a very difficult role um, as a liaison and representing us um, on the policy side and working with all of you so closely in the background. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Marcy. Chris Kern. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, 
just a few things I, you know, Marcy covered so many of the details that we've been dealing with this week well that I'm not, I don't need to recap those, but I, I, this has been one of the more difficult um, weeks, probably to say the least, uh, for the South of Falcon group, at least in my recollection. And last year was pretty tough too. Um, but I think it also provides a pretty darn good example of how the council adapts to things we're seeing change. We had two model updates that um, have come through this this process, this or at least the first iteration of their use coming through this process this year. We've got a conservation, additional conservation buffer that has been applied on the H4 component. We had a higher end escapement goal. Um, and those are all reactions, at least in part, to things we're seeing out there that change. And um, for folks who, who may be looking from the outside and wondering if the council just keeps doing the same old thing over and over again, the answer is a resounding no uh, in this case. That said, it's been tough. We've had to recalibrate all our brains to sort of the new outcomes and kind of the things we thought we knew and how things normally work has changed a little bit. And uh, as Marcy mentioned, uh, the SAS folks uh, just worked doggedly all this week to get through that. And they, they made it, they, they got to the end. Um, we've got a little ways to go, but we're, we're, we're narrowing in and, um, that's due to their hard work. And I will second the, um, the, uh, the thank you to staffs, uh, both California and Oregon, those who are here and those who weren't, um, as well as the, S, uh, the SDT and, and some of our own staffs that aren't on the STT. Um, so, um, I'll leave it at that, but I really appreciate all the hard work and, and we'll get back to it in April. Thanks, Chris. Further discussion? Mark, uh, Chair Grolnick. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, <clears throat> I want to repeat all the thanks. I'm not going to go through them again in the interest of time, but, uh, everyone worked really hard under very challenging uh, circumstances. Uh, I just, I just want to take this opportunity to point out that the, the, uh, the risks to our salmon populations uh, are not a consequence of the fisheries that we manage. They're a consequence of natural and human impacts on the habitat for our salmon. Uh, NIMPS has taken a very highly precautionary approach to, uh, our, to, our, to our climate stock as a proxy for our California coastal. And we, we got guidance from CDFW to increase escapement. But um, a lot of those adults that will escape may not successfully provide us any natural production unless there's cold water. And drought is a challenge, but also as a challenge uh, are the operations of the water systems, of the dams, of the water projects um, that are shipping a lot of water that salmon need. Uh, to grow crops that are highly prized overseas. And so I, I would ask that the federal and state agencies that are here regulating the fishery uh, take as firm a line with those water projects, both in the Klamath Basin, which we're dealing with a lot of water diversions, as well as the state and federal water projects to ensure that steps we're taking here to protect those stocks uh, don't go down the drain, so to speak, because we haven't taken care of their freshwater habitat. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. Anyone else? Susan Bishop, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanna echo the thanks of everyone else around this table. Um, there's a lot, as many people have noticed, there's a large diversity of um, uh, relationships to the, in my case, the salmon that are around the table, but and a lot of the discussion happens offline or in the hallways, very long hours we saw this week people put in, but the impressive aspect of it was that they were all pulling together to combine their um, very effective and substantial uh, problem solving capabilities to focus on um, how to address the conservation concerns that we have in front of us and how they could work together to do this in a way that would still provide some fishing opportunity to collectively together. So I think that often the public and others that aren't as um, a part of this 
process, you know, sort of seeing how the sausage is made some days, that often gets underestimated um, in terms of exactly how much collaboration there is and how often people might set aside or at least um, lower their own, uh, you know, what would be in their own best interest to help out uh, somebody else, another community, um, and above all the resource. So I just wanted to make sure that that was said before we left this week, given how difficult this week has been. Thanks, Susan. Anyone else? Okay. I'll call for the questions. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next, I'll go to Joe Oatman. The tribal, Joe? Jo? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, I do have a motion, and I uh, provide that to Sandra. I want to check to see if she received that, and if so, if that could be placed on the screen. Okay, I'm looking for the little OK sign, so. Okay, Joe, it's, it's, it's on the screen. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Sandra, for getting that put up on the screen. Uh, so I move the council adopt for public review the proposed salmon management alternatives for the 2022 tribal ocean fisheries as described in agenda item E7A, supplemental STT report one, Table three, dated March 14, 2022. Thank you, Joe. I'm, it sounds like you don't have a screen, but I can, can confirm that that is, that is uh, accurate, what I'm looking at. So uh, second by Kyle Addicts. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Joe, please speak to your motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for the second. Uh, so as, as we've heard, uh, you know, earlier in the week, you know, the tribes are proposing uh, these moderate increases um, based upon the more optimistic forecast. Um, they recognize that uh, you know, we still need to continue uh, rebuilding stocks that have been declared overfished while also trying to accommodate the treaty right to half of the harvestable surplus passing through um, the treaty regional and custom uh, areas. Um, tribes uh, you know, estimate that these levels will meet the management objectives of stocks of concern as well as uh, international obligations. And so with that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I, I do um, commend the tribes on being able to uh, get to the place that they have uh, on these uh, uh, treaty troll um, uh, management alternatives. And I uh, look forward to uh, more work and discussion uh, after uh, this action here today. And thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Joe. Um Call addicts, call. Are you? Sorry. Sorry, my, my first forget this week. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I just noticed that the, the motion says agenda item E7A, and I believe it should read D7A. So if I could, I would suggest to amend the motion to read Agenda item D7A. Thank you, Kyle. Second by Phil Anderson. Thanks, Phil. They're rough. So Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, I think that that's a clear enough intention just to reference the right document. Very good. Okay, well, we need to discuss that, I don't think. So um, 
All those in favor of the amendment to the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Further discussion on the amended motion? Okay. Um, I'll call for the question. All those um, in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. I do believe now is the time um, I saw that there was the uh, um, a couple of speakers from the Kripke tribes. Um, I believe uh, Bruce, Jim, and Wilbur Slockish are now online. And so probably now we'll let them speak uh, to the council. Bruce, Bruce, Wilbur, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Yeah, I've got uh, Wilbur here, and uh, I'll have Wilbur uh, speak first uh, on his opinion, and uh, then I'll come after Wilbur. Please. Sorry for the delay. Found that we had problems with the uh, uh, computer or whatever this is. Uh, I'm just telling Wilbur, that's why machines are never going to take over for humans. <laughs> Okay, good morning, uh, members of the council. I'm uh, listening to some of these things that you guys are saying and, and uh, hearing about the, the habitat issues from, I don't know who that was, but salmon aren't dumb. They have survived many natural disasters, uh, landslides, erupting mountains, but the things that is that they're having trouble with is uh, the economic practices involving water, land issues, and, and, and in the mountains, the harvest of trees and uh, irrigation and navigation. And it, it, all, it, it always involves around uh, economic interests uh, of communities and no one's paying attention to our uh, cultural needs economically and spiritually and, and physicality of, of, of the salmon, what he means to us. Whenever I catch a salmon and, and he looks me in the eye and he said, I fulfill my duties to you. Now it's your turn to take care of the water, my home, where I live, where I grow up and raise my young. So th these are things there that you never experience in, in your school system because it's not taught. Water is commodity there, used to irrigate uh, dry farmlands, used to transport barges, and uh, all of the industrial practices, whether it's gold mining, coal mining, uh, uranium extraction, it all involves water, nuclear issues. And he's never taught to take care of the water, the strictness of the water. So in April, uh, uh, yeah, I hope it's in person because uh, talking over this year is, is not the same as, as in person to see uh, how we feel about this, this resource, what you call resource, but what we call our livelihood. Uh, in all of the things there that they have survived and then the dam building process, what it involved, how it made the rivers, lakes, warms the water, uh, flood spawning beds, village sites. But you don't hear that in, in, in any of the history books. It's always uh, westward expansion has uh, prospered. Well, that free market prosperity comes at a cost and it's my people's existence. We've survived many policies to exterminate our people, but we're still here. And we hope the salmon are going to be like us and still here. So be mindful of that. 
because the books only teach your story, his story, your story. And when we mention stuff, pay attention to our story because we really care for the, the God-given gifts that we try to protect through our, our words and our actions. And uh, that will, will uh, be all that I will say at this time. But please remember that the salmon were here. Uh, they lived in their natural element. And then when uh, dams were built, the promise was made that there would be plenty of fish in the river for us to harvest, but it's not. And there's more that I can say about all of these plans that are in place. But I will mention this one and then the other ones. In 1977, the states of Washington and Oregon promised, give us five years and you'll have all the fish you need. We're still waiting. How many years has it gone by? And they, and they used the numbers to not rebuild the run, but to increase harvest. So that will conclude my statement, and I will be better, uh, have more material uh, in April. Thank you for listening, and please listen, but take it in a good way, because that's the way I gave it. Not in anger, but as an educational tool. That, that's all I have to say at this time. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, <clears throat> again, my name is Bruce, uh, Jim, uh, Chairman of the Fish and oh. Wildlife Committee in Warm Springs. Um, and also a um, member of Critvik. You know, you've heard the comments that the tribes have made, and you hear them time and time again. Uh, tribes always voice our concerns with the natural resources that we are to watch over. The so-called progress has not been favorable or kind to the native peoples across the nation. Every project that has been done had a terrible effect to the tribes, lands, food resources, water, the whole ecosystem. You know, it has to be rebuilt in a way, you know, the habitat. You know, like we said before, you don't know how much salmon are out there. You never know that number. There could be so few salmon and you would be promising these people that this is how much they can fish on. You know, court cases have always guaranteed us a lot of things of 50% uh, of the fish that's destined to be in the upper river. And we have yet to see that because uh, we always put under impacts, whether it's by steelhead, whether it's by uh, lower river salmon or, or whatever. And we never get to see that number that you uh, have told us. <clears throat> you know, they, like, you know, like we said, you know, that even though you may not know the numbers, you can guesstimate or whatever else. But you know, the tribes are pretty uh, lucky in a sense that we have in a, a way and the ability to count how much salmon there is coming over uh, the dams, you know, and uh, <clears throat> over the fish ladders. And in the past, there was a promise made by treaties to the tribe and later promises made by federal officials to the tribe to return salmon to the upper reaches of the Columbia River. And what Wilbur was uh, talking about is the same feeling that the four tribes, but not only the four tribes, there's, you know, numerous tribes along this Columbia River that suffered that effect of uh, loss of land, loss of resources, loss of habitat, you know, loss of homes. That's something that you're going to hear all the time from tribal people of uh, what we have lost. But the main thing you're going to hear 
in the background is the promises that your forefathers made, the promises that your federal government has made, the promises that the federal courts have made. And yet, we have, are still sitting here kind of waiting. Then the burden of conservation is shifted towards the tribe's shoulders, where we have to supply all the salmon, uh, for even for orcas. And, uh, but we supply all the salmon from Alaska all the way down for all peoples, not just for ourselves. And you got to remember that, how important that is uh, to this resource that you are talking about, that you're talking about sharing. Just who in the hell puts that salmon there? Besides the Creator, the tribes, we have help from the state, we have help from the federal governments, but yet we are in dire need of help ourselves to rebuild or build up our hatcheries so we can have a sustainable release. Our hatcheries are over 50, 60 years old. And when we try to get help to do that, and then we're ordered by the government to create more fish, we can't do it because our hatcheries are in poor condition. So that much I'll leave you with, and hopefully we'll see you in April in person. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Wilbur, for uh, your testimony. Um, questions for either Bruce or uh, Wilbur? Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Anything else on this agenda item? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, it has been an interesting week to say the least, but thank you for um, getting us through it all. We've completed the work under agenda item D7. The STT has guidance to uh, implement the uh, seasons here in the packet and come back in April. Um, we have a few adjustments, which we'll make in the meantime. Um, Staff will make any formatting adjustments as needed. Um, let's see. Uh, I think the only thing I'll bring up under this agenda item is earlier on in the week, uh, we had the council had talked to the STT about uh, some guidance under agenda item D3. We talked a little bit about the FRAM update, a little bit about the uh, killer well threshold, and I just wanted to um, be clear on the guidance that uh, the STT talked about some things this morning when they were uh, in their public session and um, is going to do some work between now and April to work with the SSC on describing what a um, the FRAM update is and some of those um, data that went into that. And then secondly, um, work with the SSC once we get to April on perhaps a timeline and workload on what a technical review uh, for the killer well threshold might be. So I wanted to clarify that was the guidance and that is the plan of the STT unless um, we hear differently here. And other than that, I think that uh, wraps up D7. Okay. Thank you, Robin. And with that, we'll go straight to um, D8, the appointment of uh, salmon hearing officers. And Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D8. Um, every year we have three salmon hearings hosted by the council. We have one in each state of Washington, Oregon, and California. Uh, we do that so that we can hear uh, from the public their uh, opinions on the uh, three alternatives we've adopted here today. Um, we 
Uh, also have under this agenda item an attachment that just has a, uh, a list of uh, where and how we plan on meeting and how the um, uh, representatives might be uh, attending uh, that meeting. And so under this agenda item, we'd like to identify uh, who the representatives will be at uh, those hearings and then uh, also um, perhaps talk a little bit about the venue for those hearings. Thank you, that wraps up my summary of D8. Okay, thank you, Robin. I, I believe we're talking about going to a virtual meeting. And Merrick will probably have to speak to that, Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, related to this item is the, as, as Robin indicated, is the question of the venue and the format of the meeting. Um, we have been moving forward um, with the intention of um, having a hybrid style uh, series of ham salmon hearings. Um, given uh, the way that our hybrid meetings with the SAS um, went this week, um, our recommendation to staff is to take a step back and um, continue to host those uh, remotely at this time, rather than continuing to move forward with the in-person hybrid model that we had been planning on. Um, we simply, uh, although we, we may be able to pull something together for the April council meeting, um, we do not anticipate being able to do that for these hearings. And so we would be limited to the systems that we have tried to use here this week that um, have not been uh, extraordinarily effective Given the public uh, involvement nature of these hearings, we think it's uh, paramount that we, we do what we know works. And um, at the moment, I don't think we're confident in the hybrid model or confident enough in the hybrid model to continue to pursue the in-person hybrid option for these hearings. So that is our recommendation is to take a half step back and continue this year with a remote setting, but happy to answer any questions about that. Questions for uh, Merrick, Kyle? Not a question for Merrick, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm I'm supportive of doing that. I'm happy to um, serve as a hearing officer this year. I wasn't sh honestly sure if the Washington meeting location had the Wi-Fi technology to do a hybrid meeting. Um, was a little worried about the meeting space. Um, normally, we we all fit in the room where we have it fine, but with people trying to spread out a little more, I didn't know if that room would be large enough. So. Um, I'm supportive of, of doing a virtual hearing for Washington. Okay, wonderful. Um, National Fishery Service. Oh. National Fishery Service. S Susan, the, the attendee for for National Fishery Service. Uh, Jeremy Jording will be our representative at the Westport uh, hearing. Okay. Um, we're still discussing among staff who will be attending the Oregon and California. Uh, hearing so uh, I can provide that uh, name to Robin um, and I we should be able to do that next week okay very good thank you and uh, look to the two oh Phil Anderson I plan to uh, join Kyle at the Westport hearing okay Chris yeah uh, Mr. Vice Chair first of all I'm also supportive of doing it in the virtual uh, format I've talked to our SES representatives and they're pretty much unanimous that they're in support of doing that as well, given the limitations and things that have been discussed. So that's good. Um, I'll be the, I can be the hearing officer for the Oregon meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, California, Chair Gronick. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Pettinger. I'll be the hearing officer for California in the virtual hearing. Okay, Marcy, I see your hand up. Marcy? Yeah, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just. Uh, wanted to echo our support for the virtual uh, platform and note that our uh, SAS and advisors uh, are likewise supportive. Um, and another reason that they support not trying to get together in person uh, in Eureka pertains to higher gas prices. So I think everyone uh, here in California welcomes the opportunity to use Ring Central, um, which we know is an effective platform. For a virtual meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. And I just looked to Lieutenant Lingo as far as I see the names in the uh, briefing book, and those are accurate as far as the individuals. Mr. Vice Chair, yes, they are. Very good. Okay. I think I think we're done here, but I always look to Robin to make sure we're good. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, for agenda item D8, thank you uh, to the states and other agencies for providing uh, warm bodies, if you will, to sit in those seats. I really appreciate that. I hear that uh, these three salmon hearings will be virtual and we will not have an in-person aspect to that. All of the uh, virtual login information is already on our website. That won't change. We'll just um, modify the website to reflect virtual only. And so with that, I think you've completed your agenda item here under D8. Okay. And Sam for the March council meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. All right, well, with that, I'm gonna hand the gavel back to uh, Chair Grolnick and he could uh, take it from there. All right. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, we only have one item left. It's the remaining item on C7. But first, I wanted to apologize for not recognizing that today is Pi Day, March 14th. So I want to wish everyone a happy Pi Day. I'm sorry there's no pie in the room here, but you have the rest of the day to take care of that for yourselves. So my recollection is we have completed our discussion on April. And we uh, are now uh, ready for our discussion on year at a glance. I've got some folks changing seats, so we'll just pause here for a moment. All right, I think we're all seated now. Um, we have, uh, we've received some requests from advisory bodies and management teams uh, for a year at a glance. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Berner, I can turn to you to sort of get us, to get the uh, pump reprimed here on our year at a glance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a whole lot more uh, beyond what I've, already given you as an over for, overview for the year at a glance. We did have several recommendations from advisory bodies as we went through those reports. So I guess I would just open the floor to comments or suggestions from council members on, on modifications to the year at a glance at this point. All right, thank you. I see that Maggie Summer has her hand up. So Maggie, please. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll jump right in with some thoughts on groundfish so we can uh, avoid going too long into the lunch hour. Uh, certainly support the addition of a stock definition scoping item in June on the supplemental year at a glance. Uh, I will note that uh, there may be several stages to scoping this item as the GMT observed in their report. Um, I expect it will be a multi-step process with some, some iteration as we gain a more full understanding of all the implications and needs related to this issue. Uh, but for June, uh, I believe staff might be able to prepare an initial scoping document laying out just the, uh, some proposed and anticipated issues and decisions. And that would really set up the council and uh, advisory bodies and the public to react to that. And the groundfish principles to start planning how to tackle uh, an FMP amendment. And also note that scheduling this first step in June could also, uh, there might be some synergy there with the final stock assessment prioritization for 2023 could be some could be helpful to have those together. I would also support uh, the other GMT recommendations or, or the GMT recommendations, pardon me, for the June agenda, which are to unshade the gear switching update and the limited entry fixed gear program review finalization, noting that uh, the intent for that uh, limited entry fixed gear program review finalization would uh, simply be finalizing the review document uh, and any recommendations, uh, the research and data needs, pardon me, et cetera, coming out of that. This would not be scoping or picking up any further action on the follow on actions that we discussed earlier at this meeting. Those have yet to be prioritized. Um, and I would suggest we consider moving the trawl catch share review to a later date, given the amount of uh, groundfish workload on the June agenda. Scoping of that, um, I would expect to include uh, only planning the schedule, what's in and out of scope, consideration of the process. For example, do we use, do we want to use a community advisory body, et cetera? 
Uh, I think that that would make sense moving to September. Um, and then just my last comment on ground fish is that if it's appropriate, I would support uh, unshading the ground fish items that are proposed to remain at the June meeting, providing the council agrees with that proposal for planning purposes. Uh, and forgive me, I just can't recall whether we usually do that at, at this time or wait to the April meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. And we do have 6.8 days at this point. <laughs> for June. Merrick? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Maggie, for uh, that, that guidance. Um, just on the matter of the trawl, um, trawl scoping item, um, if I refer back to our discussion of the budget committee report, um, you all did adopt the recommendations in the budget committee, one of which was to um, uh, encourage the council and council staff to work with NIMFS on the trawl cost uh, project that was uh, recently, I think the West Coast region staff recently submitted a, a proposal for. Um, my understanding is that we should be okay um, to remove that item from June if you so desire. Um, it would uh, put staff in the position of um, working on that project um, without your guidance for a time. And I do want to flag that for you, um, just so that we're all clear. Um, and if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that, but I do want to make sure that we are all on the same page there. Thank you, Merrick. Looking around the table for further guidance. Uh, Maggie Summer, your hand is up, and then Ryan Wolf. Hey, thanks, I was just going to... Uh thank the executive director for that reminder i think that's a, a good consideration uh my my recommendation on moving it to september was was really simply a reflection of what appears to be a very substantial groundfish workload in june uh, but i'm i'm quite open to other perspectives on uh, the importance of, of beginning scoping the trial catch share review um, uh, issue in june Thank you, uh, Ryan, and then John Ugretz. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and I support um, what Maggie said in, in her recommendations. A couple other things from NIMP's perspective. Um, I appreciate that uh, added shaded in June um, at the very bottom uh, is the financial disclosure and recusal policy that came out in November. So I think it would be good to uh, have an hour for the council to look at that. I'm glad it's on the agenda. Uh, we can also submit an informational report in April so folks can start to consider that. Um, I'd also note, uh, since Maggie talked about groundfish, as far as HMS, and John may speak to this next, um, the HMS MT recommendations NIMS would support, that uh, would be postponing the uh, swordfish monitoring management program agenda item in June. So that might give us a little more time in June. And then I wanted to come back to uh, what Mr. Dooley said uh, during the last um, session here on this agenda item in looking longer term as we get back to in-person meetings taking advantage of everything we've learned you know we i talked about this a little bit at, a, at a, one of our previous meetings last year um, but NIMS would definitely like to see some sort of focused discussion on the on the lessons learned during the pandemic and and how these successes and, and other aspects might be incorporated into our future council and advisory body meetings uh, I noted during the budget committee, and you can see it in that report, that the North Pacific Council is taking on a similar initiative um, at their upcoming meeting. Um, they have a, a staff paper uh, with a, quite a number of range of options for them to consider. Uh, that is one way we could uh, potentially move forward. Uh, I would also be open to some sort of ad hoc committee approach as well, uh, comprised council staff, state staff, NIM staff, uh, others. Uh, to also look into this and potentially bring something back to the council. Again, these are just ideas, very open to other approaches, but do want to ensure some time uh, coming up here and not, we don't have a specific recommendation on that yet, but I wanted to at least put this out there uh, to see if there can be some discussion of how things might be 
Well, on, on anything we might want to change regarding our longer term process, once we are looking at uh, back to full time in person meetings going forward. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you for that, Ryan. Uh, John Ugaretz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, Ryan uh, forecast my thoughts exactly. I wanted to talk a little bit about HMS. Um, I also support uh, the management team's recommendation to postpone discussion of swordfish management monitoring plan. I think they've got more than enough on their plate um, to not be adding that. Also, I'll let, uh, let you know that I've been thinking a lot about this plan. I think um, that there is definite work that needs to be done beyond a simple rewrite of the plan. There's a lot more thought that needs to go into it. And I'd suggest moving it to September shaded at this point in hopes that we have some time to have a little bit of council um, thought about it when we get into workload planning, maybe in June, um, to discuss some ideas for how to move forward with that plan. I'd also note that the team recommends moving the EFH phase two report until there's funding available. I'd suggest moving that to November shaded and hope that funds become available sometime before then. Um, but then also there's a statement in the team report um, regarding the bycatch performance metrics and the um, preliminary preferred alternative for hard caps. And I'm wondering, I don't know if the team is still online and able to respond but I, I just need some better understanding about that request um, and their ability to complete both of those for June. Um, and if not June, why, why not? Uh, so we can make a decision because they did ask for some council priority between the PPA and bycatch performance and it seems to be indicating they, they don't feel they can do both. So I don't know, Mr. Chair, if that's possible to get a little more information from them. Well, I, I don't see Steve Stowe's on line, but if there's someone else from the team who is prepared to respond, um, please speak up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Is there someone from the team that wants to respond to Mr. Ugaritz's uh, question? Well, I tried, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I suspect we will just have to check back in on that in April. Um, Hello. When we talk. Whoop. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Chair, Mr. Ugaritz? Yes, go ahead. Who's this? Uh, this is Steve Stos. I, uh, I thought I was both online and on my phone, but I guess I was only on my phone. So uh, my apologies for the technical snafu. But uh, I am available to um, address the, the issue John just raised. Please. Um, so uh, uh, in our future uh, workload planning discussion last week, um, the team struggled with the uh, question of whether we could address both the hard caps and the bycatch performance metrics assignments. Uh, there were several uh, factors that we talked about. Uh, one is just that, and well, I mean, it's been repeated often, but the, the team has um, certainly felt the challenge of working in the virtual meeting format under the pandemic. It's hurt our, our ability to communicate and get work done as efficiently as when we meet in person. Uh, we've also, um, a lot of us have struggled personally with uh, pandemic related issues. Um, I won't get into that. And uh, we, ha we had a very productive discussion last week on the um, hard cap analysis, and we think we've identified a way forward on that, but uh, it's rather complex, and there's 
a fair amount of uncertainty about how much time it would take for us to complete that work. So that, that's one uh, issue to consider. And then secondly, on the DGN performance metrics assignment, um, the team is aware of a revision that was made to the regression tree methodology for estimating non fin fish bycatch species um, bycatch. And we're in the process of updating that to uh, address fin fish bycatch, but that's another um, kind of uncertain analytical lift that, uh, that we it has kind of clouded our certainty about being able to complete both assignments, especially given that um, there's been a loss of several uh, participants of previous work that were done on both the hard caps and bycatch performance metrics uh, one of the key people on bycatch performance metrics is no longer on the team. Uh, he's willing to meet with us. But anyway, there's a lots of uh, there's lots of questions about whether we can get that far by June. Okay, uh, John, um, did that give you the answer you're looking for? That uh, perhaps June is not right for those agenda items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, I think if I'm hearing it correctly, that both on June at the same time is probably too big of a lift. And um, I think from my perspective, I would push bycatch performance off by one or two meetings similar to EFH and swordfish management and monitoring. Okay. And obviously in April, but we will finalize the June agenda, but for the purposes of year to glance, we can push those off, I think. Uh, Bob Dooley, you had your hand up. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I roll it back to the comments made by, by Ryan earlier and my earlier comments on the prior agenda item. Um, it seems like we get to last day. Everybody's pretty tired after a week. And it seems like we heard a lot this this meeting about the budget, about our future plans of being, you know, how we're going to do business as a council, whether it be in person or whether it be hybrid or whether it be virtual. And it seems like we also heard that there are new initiatives and things that are being contemplated and more workload. And we all know that workload's been a, a huge issue for all the council, all of our advisory panels, everybody involved. And we seem to be getting to a place where we might not be able to get what we need to get done, our business. It seems like there's a maybe a need for a focused discussion that is aside from the issues, aside from the agenda items of how we're going to do business in the future, whether that is doing some form of hybrid meetings in between or, or some uh, virtual meetings. And I think this all speaks to maybe uh, getting some thought to a focused council, for a better word, retreat to deal with this when we're not trying to do business, when we're trying to do that business and focus on that. And, and think outside the box of how we can streamline this process, maybe do it better, more efficiently to get more done because there's more demands being added every meeting. So it's just a thought. And I would look to our, our executive director and, and uh, staff and of course our chairman and to, to maybe come up with a way to to deal with this that isn't necessarily an agenda item. So we're, we're having trouble keeping our agendas not impacted. So I, I'd stop right there, but I just was wanted to bring that up. So, so what I'm hearing you say is you're suggesting an agenda item to have that discussion and not to have that discussion here. Yes, in a future time, but I think that it, it, I don't want to see my own personal preference. I don't want to see this as being something we deal with in our normal agenda or our normal meeting schedule. I would like to see a separate, maybe for a better word, retreat for the council to focus on how we can better do our business. And 
and have that be the topic, not not everything else as well, because that is very, uh, for a better word, distracting to to get it uh, to get to the answer of this. So thank you. All right, thanks, Bob. Uh, Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Dooley. Um, but I, I am uh, also um, I have interest in figuring out how to be more efficient with our operations and uh, decision making. And I think there is a lot that we can learn from um, our COVID situation. I think there are some silver linings there. I think there, uh, the, the paper that the North Pacific Council staff assembled has certainly triggered a lot of my thinking. Um, I, I would propose and uh, look to Ryan um, maybe uh, for a nod here, but I would propose that we start by, um, if Ryan is inclined to have his staff work with my staff to, to put together a, a white paper first, um, just on how, how we might think through these things and the steps that we could take. I would be very reluctant to try to do that in June, just looking at our YAG, um, but maybe it's something we can pull together here over the next few months and uh, have something for you at the September time. Um, just to help us organize our thoughts and get this these concepts rolling and from there, you know, maybe we can put together a retreat or something like that, but I think a white paper would be a good way for us to start focusing our thoughts and organizing our thoughts and then uh, proceed appropriately if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, it's certainly a topic worthy of discussion and therefore it's worthy of an agenda item rather than having the discussion during meeting planning. Um, but there are lessons to be learned and we should, uh, the silver linings we should capture and retain. Um, it wasn't all challenges. We did learn some good things. Um, further comments on the year at a glance. Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to provide a comment at the uh, year of a glance schedule. So if possible, uh, I would suggest we add to our June meeting an item on the clarification on tribal advisory body seats in the council process. Uh, from my perspective, um, you know, this could either be a standalone item or we could possibly deal with it under routine administrative agenda item that involves membership appointment and council operating procedures. Uh, it is expected that I, as the travel seat of the council, will coordinate with NOAA general counsel to bring back a recommendation at that time to clarify and address this matter. Thank you, Joe. What is the council? Anyone object to that? It is something we need to address. If we can find time in June, as Joe suggested. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Maggie, followed by Marcy. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to support uh, the GMT's request in their report to be in person at the June meeting. Uh, I assume there is a lot of planning going on for logistics for that meeting already. I'm going to offer my support for that. Hope that they, along with the rest of us, can be in person. But even uh, even some consideration of them meeting in person, as some of the salmon groups have been at these meetings, if for some reason the full council is not able to meet in person. Thank you, Maggie. It's certainly the hope. Uh, Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had a question on the Pacific halibut line item on the YAG. Um, just noting that we have September slated as preliminary recommendations on the directed commercial fishery and then final in November. And I'm just asking and it there doesn't have to be an answer now but i'm thinking back uh to our past halibut discussions surrounding the catch sharing plan and i thought that we needed a three meeting process for any major changes and i guess i'm just asking um 
that there be some consideration as to whether or not that's necessary or not for directed commercial uh, regulatory changes that we might um, wish to make that presumably would be effective for 2023. Um, potentially, we could add another um, item if three meetings were needed uh, in March. So again, doesn't need resolution now, but um, just flagging that and asking if we need three or if two suffices. Thanks. Thank you, Marcy. I don't know the answer, but we're certainly going to have to get the answer in time. But thanks for pointing that out. Uh, any anything further on year at a glance? Query writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to support um, the recommendation of the EWG uh, to unshade the um, ecosystem item currently agendized for September FEP initiatives update um, and also take their suggestion to um, include final adoption of the FEP appendix in that item. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, Corey. Is there any objection to that unshading of those future agenda items? Obviously, everything is subject to change, but for planning purposes, is there any objection to unshading that? And Mike, do you see any issues with that? Okay. Uh, anything further? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands, so Mike, I'm going to ask how we're doing on East, on C7. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that those recommendations for a year at a glance, and I will uh, make those modifications for your uh, April briefing book. We can talk about those again. I think April's pretty well set, and we'll be filing that FR this afternoon, so I appreciate that guidance as well. Um, yeah, I think we're there. Thank you. Well, that would complete our last agenda item. Before I hear a motion, I just want to see if there's anything else folks want to bring up at this meeting before we go our separate ways. Merrick? Uh, All right, Danny from the great state of Alaska. I'm sorry I didn't see your hand up. Yeah, if there's nothing further, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Well, I am not seeing anything further, so your motion would be more than welcome. Well, good. Uh, I move that we adjourn the March 2022 council meeting. All right. Uh, I don't know if you'll get a second, but I'll, I'll take a look and see if there's a second seconded by Corey Writings. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of discussion on this motion, but uh, I, we won't hear it. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone, for the hard work this week. And I guess we'll see you in a few weeks. Take care, everyone. <laughs>